on sale this month from our daddy, the Magic Order issue two. Nemesis Reloaded, issue two, art by superstar Jorge Hermenes. And Nightclub issue three for the staggering price of $1.99. Starting in March, also my birthday. The Ambassadors, a six-pack series from, uh, from Dad and the six biggest artists in comics. Frank Quitley, Carl Keschel, Travis Charé, Oliver Kuppel, Matteo Bufkini and Matteo Scalera. The world's first superhero has been created, but, he's not metrop- but she's not Metropolis or Gotham City. She's in Korea and she wants to share powers with the best of people from every major country. This is Willy Wonka with superpowers. Don't miss it. Hey. Hey there, how are you doing? Yeah, nice to meet you face to face. I know, it's fantastic actually. You know, do you know what's funny? I've been reading your stuff for, you know, 40 years or something. I never know. Do people call you John Mark? They call you JM? What, what do people JM say? is good, yeah. Yeah. No, JM, yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, John John is my legal first name and right. nobody uses it. And if I know if someone calls and asks for John, it's like the government or a phone solicitor or something, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it's either JM or my family will call me Mark, you know, and that's about it, you know, but I'm really happy. I'm happy with JM. Do you know in Scotland, we used to all call you JM because you, you don't say J in Scotland, you say J. So Jai? I always do use Jim. Jim. Oh, that's I, so I, funny. Always refer. You know, like Jay Z, we call Jai Z. We call him Jai Z. That's the. Uh, the oh, right that's person. really funny. <laughs> it's also you know like in, in India when they talk to gurus, it's like you know they, the J A I, you know Jai Guru Dev and all that stuff and Jai Mayer Baba. So uh, I'm glad you're all uh, saluting me in that way. <laughs> 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 but I'm so glad we got to finally hook up because it's, it's been a kind of crazy few weeks. But like uh, you were literally one of the first three people I had when I said I was going to do these, um, you know, because I've read your stuff forever. And I always what I always thought was funny, actually, is you always seemed like one of us, you know, like the British guys. You seemed like the really cool American guy. You know, like I used to <laughs> you were one of the guys I would seek out, you know, even when I was young, you know, I would, I would seek out the credit because I knew you were getting your money's worth. You know, it was going to be it was going to be a good story. Yeah, Brooklyn is as far from being a British guy as you can possibly get, I think. <laughs> Although maybe not. Maybe not. It depends on which part of England, I guess. Yeah. Well, do you know, culturally, it's actually not crazy different. Like, um, the rest of America is a little different, but like New York, especially Brooklyn, you know, like in the 50s, like my dad's favorite show was Phil Silvers and things like that. You know, so it's, it's uh-huh. weird. You know, and a lot of, of Jewish humor in particular plays very well in Scotland because... Really? It's, it's, oh, massively, yeah. Like, massively, like, uh, you know... Curb Your Enthusiasm and uh, Seinfeld was a disaster in England, right? They used to have it on at a midnight slot on the BBC. Nobody nobody watched it, but in Scotland, we all got the VHSs and everything. It's like... So why do you think that is? We talk quickly, and uh, uh-huh. we've, we've got an ironic sense of humor and everything. Well, there you, you know, go. So okay. Like, yeah. 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 So yeah. it plays, yeah. plays but It's a Jackie Mason thing, guys, like this, or maybe not even that big in the States. Huge when I was growing up. Huge. When That's I was so up. funny. Yeah, yeah. It's, that's really funny. So Seinfeld could walk through London and probably be okay, but walks through Scotland and get mobbed, you know. That's hilarious. That's that's really that's really interesting. I'll keep that in mind the next time I'm in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know they call Scotland the Lost Tribe of Israel as well. I mean, that's the, the I've name. never heard truly. I've never heard that. That's really funny. So I don't know what started at all, you know, but like for some reason it just works, you know. It's it's nothing I would ever put together in my head, but that's really, really interesting. Really interesting. If Mel Gibson fast, had fast talking and sarcasm, you you pretty much defined New York and, <laughs> and Brooklyn specifically, you know? <laughs> but listen, you know, it's funny, like, because uh, you're the same age as my brothers, you know, that most of my brothers are all around the same age. And, uh, you know, they were all born uh, early to mid 50s and everything, you know, you you you're right on the cusp of what my brothers had, which was Marvel mania, you know, like whenever... You know, you were learning to read. You were probably reading DC comics, I'd guess. You know, yeah. just before mm-hmm. the Marvel stuff sort of really took off. But do you remember that transition? You know, like whenever you had a certain type of comic book story, which was very, you know, bread and butter, uh, quite one dimensional, but great fun, wonderful comics. But then Marvel coming in and changing everything. Do you? I have very, very clear. I have very, very clear memories of that. 
What does it because when, when I was really, when I was a, a bit too young for them, I remember, because, you know, I was like, like most of us were growing up, I was a comic book addict. I would read anything if it had words and pictures together. I didn't care if it was Sad Sack, Archie, Superman, Batman, whatever it was. <clears throat> and the Marvel started coming out. And they if if you look at them in the context of the time, they were ugly. Yeah. Compared to what DC was doing. The colors were garish. If you remember the early ones, they had these lettering on the cover with big black lines around the balloons. And, <laughs> you know, the Kirby stuff was so to a little kid who's used to Kurt Swan and Wayne Boring. Kirby and Ditko were like from another dimension. So I, I, I would see them on the stands. And one day I remember I bought Avengers number one and Marvel Tales number one, which had like the origin of Spider-Man, the origin of the Hulk and a few other things. And they kind of freaked me out. <laughs> I, they were like, you know, at first I read the Marvel Tales and I was like, well, this is really weird and interesting. And I actually went back yeah. to my local candy store, which is about three blocks away and picked up the Avengers thing and read that. And then it was kind of like, no, nah, I'm not, I'm just not ready for this. I'm not ready for this. <laughs> but the funny thing is when I, I, and I forget about this sometimes, the one Marvel comic I read regularly, when I think of the person I grew up to be, it's hilarious to me. I loved war comics as a kid. I read Sergeant Fury. I read Sergeant Fury religiously. You know, I love Sergeant Rock and Johnny Cloud and our fighting forces, all that stuff. Yeah. But, you know, we, when I was a kid growing up, the, the two things that you saw on TV in the United States were either Westerns or war, war. When World War II, it was like, even though it was like quite a way in the past, it was still very fresh in the popular consciousness. Yeah. And there were always documentaries on. So the war thing, you know, we all had our toy helmets and toy rifles and I loved Sergeant Fury. It was the only Marvel comic I read. And then when I was in the seventh grade, there was, it was sort of like, it was almost like the comic book equivalent of Beatlemania. This Marvel mania started to spread through my junior high school. Yeah. And I thought, well, let me go check these things out again. And, and uh, I remember I picked up the Spider-Man. It was the second part of the, of the first John Romita story with the Green Goblin. Right. A Fantastic Four, Thor, uh, Daredevil. I still remember sitting, I had the giant Catholic church across the street from my apartment building. And I would go sometimes to just sit out in front of the church and read. And I remember sitting in front of the church very distinctly reading Daredevil 19, Alone Against the Underworld. But it was like, it was the perfect setting because I kind of had a religious conversion from DC to Marvel. <laughs> and so, uh, and that was it. I became, it was like Marvel, that was it. You know, I was mainlining Marvel. And it took, it wasn't until probably a few years later when Kirby went to DC that I was like, oh, if Kirby can go to DC, I guess it's safe for me to go back now, you know? <laughs> But it was a huge deal when that switch happens, like some other switch got flipped in my brain. And was it an age thing as well? Was it something where little kids like DC because of the safety of the stories and the Marvel stuff felt a little more dangerous? So that appeals when you hit 10, 12, that kind of thing. Right. Especially, you know, if you're thinking about your, you know, you're going through or at least getting ready to go through puberty and you yeah. you think you're grown up and suddenly here's this like wild looking artwork and this, what we thought at the time was hip dialogue, you know? Um, and it, it did, it was, it was very, very different people now. Cause you know, cause if you pick up a DC comic or a Marvel comic, mm -hmm. they really, no matter how much the two companies want to say they're really different, they're not. They're identical. They're homogenized now. Yeah. Well, most of the people are going back and forth between the companies all the time. Yeah. But then it was a real difference. It was a huge difference. You could not confuse the two. You know, um, when I read that, I remember when I read that Marvel Tales and they had the Hulk's origin and with Kirby's artwork to my little, I kept thinking everyone, everyone's, they had a picture of Thunderbolt Ross and he, I thought, oh, he must be the Hulk because he looks like, the real people look like monsters. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, so that, that, like I said, so in the beginning it was like overwhelming and then some switch flipped in my brain and maybe that's just it. I needed a couple more years yeah. and then I was, I was hooked and that was that. It's funny because those Marvel guys came from the monster comics as well, didn't they? So they grew up doing yeah. scary kind of stuff. Where the DC stuff, that 50s, 60s stuff felt more like fairy tales, didn't it? Everything. Yeah, and like they did that sort of very slick science fiction y stuff. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but whereas the, it's true, the, the Marvel superheroes grew right out of that monster stuff. That's what the Fantastic Four was, really. The thing was a monster, and the Hulk was a monster. And yeah. I wonder if we missed something, you know, with the companies homogenizing so much, you know, because. You had such a crossover, you know, it was that cross pollination of styles where you would start to see Kirby dots and DC comics and everything, you know. But there was something quite nice about that, wasn't there, when they had their own distinct flavor? Because yeah, Marvel to yeah. me always felt like a soap opera. Like D DC felt yes. mythological, didn't it? And Marvel felt like an ongoing soap. And Peter Parker was a sort of, you would never get Dick was Peter Parker and a DC comic like that look. No, not in a million years in that era. No, yeah, yeah, it's true. It's true. They were very distinctive. 
And uh, well, now, you know, yeah, it's hard. The, the good news is that there's just a wide variety of material out there now, yeah. and not just from two companies, but from many companies. But it's true that, you know, as writers, we struggle to find our own voice. And then each company had a voice. I don't know if you could say that necessarily Marvel has a voice or DC has a particular voice these days, or any company that I can think of has a voice in that level of identity that's very, very unique to that. It's much more like um, a movie studio. You know, if you go to see a Paramount movie or or, or a Fox movie or whatever it is, it, you don't, you're not expecting a certain thing. Although if you go back in time to the 30s and 40s, yeah. movie studios had identities, but that doesn't exist anymore, you know? Maybe because it's all more corporate, I don't know. That's interesting, you know, because comics felt more like bands to me back then, you know, like I always thought like Marvel and DC felt like music scenes and the individual guys, like a Steve Englehart comic, felt like an early 70s album, a concept right. album or something like that. Right. You know, like every, every writer had a very distinct identity too. You know, mm -hmm. people you were following. It was kind of like guys in school who were into certain bands would be into certain comics too. Yeah, I was just think it was like, you know, if you look at music in the 60s and, you know, the Beatles, of course, and you had Lennon and McCartney and Stan and Jack were like Lennon and McCartney. Yeah. You could make Ditko could be Dylan, you know, with that <laughs> other very distinct voice. And then in 70s, the way that music sort of broadened out a lot more, you know, a lot of these new people came in. It's the same thing in comics as all these young guys came in and built on what the guys in the 60s did. And music did the same thing. It's really fascinating, actually. It's funny, isn't it, the way one person can influence so many people or a handful of people can form a revolution, really, can't it? You know, so Stan and Jack and these middle-aged guys doing this stuff, suddenly you had young guys coming in like you or the guys before you, like Jerry Conway and... Engelhart and Len Wein, Marv Wolfman, you know, it's right. the ripple Steve effect Gerber. can be incredible, can't it? If you, if, yeah. if you do something good, the number of people that can be inspired is amazing to take that up. It is, career. it is, especially, you know, especially Kirby, because Kirby's certain people, you know, they're of their time and then it sort of evaporates. Yeah. And Kirby's work actually gets better with time. When I, I return to, especially the New God stuff, which is probably my favorite comics of all time, every time I go back to them, there's something more there. You know, much more than there was when I first read it back in the 70s. Um, and his influence just echoes on and on and on. Here's my big thought with New Gods, though. Like, do you think if Stan had stripped New Gods over Kirby plots, obviously, because Kirby's the greatest concept guy of all time, do you think it would have been bigger? It might have been commercially bigger. I don't think it would have been better. It's so raw, though, isn't it? You know, like... That's you know, exactly why. Yeah. You know, if we want to take the rock and roll metaphor, I always... When the Beatles split up, the first solo album that Lennon did was John Lennon Plastic Ono Band. If you're familiar with that album, it was he went through Primal Scream Therapy. It was as raw, as naked, as honest, as painful an album has ever been made. I think it's one of the greatest albums ever made. And that's kind of what the New Gods was for Kirby. It was so personal. It's like he ripped his chest open and it all came out. And, you know, it took me years to kind of get the rhythm of his writing, you know, because his writing is very quirky and very individual. Um, but on those books, especially, I feel like his. if someone else came in and was doing the dialogue in those books, I think it would have just tipped them over. There. And maybe it would have been slicker and more commercial. And I'm sure Stan would have done a great job, but it wouldn't have been the same. And and it's interesting because I, I've been rereading some of the other Kirby stuff from the era. Mm -hmm. And the New Gods really has the emotional content of New Gods because Kirby is always great for the big concept. You turn the page and... To throw up, well, I remember when I was adapting uh, Red Sun for, uh, for animation and I was reading that. It reminded me of Kirby because every page you had some other new concept that was exploding my brain a little bit. Mm -hmm. And Kirby did that every panel practically. You could pull out a panel and write a novel. And he always had that. But in the new God stuff, there was also a real emotional content there. And the characters felt, even though they were gods, they felt three-dimensional. And I feel like some of his later stuff, even though I absolutely adore it, the the the, the three-dimensionality of the characters was lost. I think Stan could have helped more with maybe with some of that stuff. Yeah. And Stan certainly could have used Kirby, you know, so. Um, <laughs> I think it's interesting, it's, ways. you know, those stand-up stand-ups, you know, there's always those stand-ups who the stand-ups really love. And I always mm -hmm. think, right. you maybe right. I was very well known, but everybody, if you really, if you really understand comedy, you know, this guy is the best right. guy, you know? And I think Kirby's New Gods is a bit like that. Like people who understand comic books and love comic books like us who've spent their whole lives in it, they can see the purity of New Gods and why it works. But what Stan was really great at was that interface with the mainstream, wasn't it? He was yeah, really good yeah. at it. Was, he was good at find, a 10-year-old finding a way into that stuff. You know? you know, and people, a lot of readers now tend to dismiss Stan's stuff. And 
And again, it goes back to what we were saying before, the contrast between what was going on then and what he was doing. Pick up an early Spider-Man comic and read the dialogue, yeah. which is fast, it's funny, it's emotional. It really, really works. And there had been nothing like it in mainstream comics ever. And was there a buzz in the schoolyard, you know, like, because you're maybe nine, ten or something when this stuff's coming out. And was there a buzz where people were saying, you should check this out? You know, like, well, that's that's happened. what happened. Well, I was in junior high school. That's what happened when I start, went back and started reading them again and got hooked. That could, because that? people were really talking about them at that point. Like a lot of kids in the class, not just. Yeah, well, at least the, at least the kids that I was hang, hanging out with. And, you know, the difference between then and now also now all of a sudden make me feel old. The difference between then and now is, you know, comics were everywhere. So if you were a boy under the age of 15, you read comics. Yes. Everybody read comics. Everyone I knew did, yeah, yeah. You okay. didn't have to seek them out. You know, I lived, like I said, I walked three blocks to the local candy store, which in Brooklyn meant it was a place where they had magazines, comic books, a soda fountain. You could buy an egg cream and get a pretzel and, you know, buy a magazine and get your comic. Yeah. And so it was everywhere. Anywhere you could buy a newspaper, you could buy a comic book. And now, you know, you have to seek out your specialty store. Do you remember the first one you ever saw? Remember the first one you ever No, picked? I don't. People have asked me that question. And it's I think it's because I don't remember a time when I wasn't reading comics in some form. What I think it is for me, it must have been growing up, you know, we had the New York Daily News and it had a big giant color comic section. And I think that was the thing where I first saw that combination of words and pictures. And you know, when I do writing classes, I talk about this, you know, why comics? And I think we're sort of like drug addicts in the sense that. There's something about that combination. And if you have the right genetic structure, a chemical drops in your brain the first time you see it. And you're you're addicted from that moment. That's it. This chemical drops. You have to continue to see the color and the words and the pictures and all this stuff. Yeah. And some people will look at that and it will do nothing for them. But us, the first time we see it, that's it for the rest of our lives. We're done. We're done so for. That evening, we're copying it on a piece of paper, aren't we? We're trying to copy the art. I mean, that night. That's my childhood. Yeah. I spent hours and hours on my living room floor, stack of paper and pencils and crayons, and I had a comic book here, and I would always freehand try to draw those covers. You know? And you know, it's funny because art is admired and literature is admired the whole world over, but somehow in the West, whenever you put those two things together, it's seen as less instead of more. Yes. Why do you yes. think that is? How did comics get that rep? You know? That's a really good question. Um you know, because really, if you think about comic strips when they first started, adults were reading the comic strips every day in the newspapers. Yeah. So I don't think adults were looking down at them. Maybe they thought of them as a light or as a diversion. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it could just be that comic books, when they started, really were geared toward kids. I don't know. But then again, you hear the stories, you know, World War II, all the soldiers, adults were sitting around overseas reading comics. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's just natural snobbery. I have no idea. I and then no you know, so you as a little kid, you know, I, I remember reading you want to be an artist before you wanted to be yeah. a writer, you know. So I think all comic book writers are guys really who started out as artists, weren't you? But but to compete at that level is so hard, doesn't it? When you're a kid, you migrate quite often into something that's a little easier, which is typing, you know. But right, you, right. what was that journey for you? I mean, it sounded like you went a little further though. You, did you go to art school or I well, you know, I, drawing was my main thing when I was a kid. Um, I was always, always, always drawing. I was the kid in the class that was the artist kid who was always drawing. Um, and then my second love came about, which became, you know, when I saw the Beatles when I was in the fifth grade on the Ed Sullivan show, and I said, I have to get guitar lessons. So there, the whole rock and roll thing came. So I always say I had very, very practical goals as a kid. I either wanted to be a, a break my living as a as a as an artist or a rock and roll star. Very, very <laughs> practical goals. Um, and so, but I continued with the art, and uh, yeah, I was I got accepted to uh, the School of Visual Arts, and. You know, I always say this explains me, this dumb working class kid from Brooklyn. I knew nothing. I didn't know like financial aid existed. And my parents said, we can't afford to send you there. I went, oh, OK. And that was it. That was it. I didn't even explore it because I had never been exposed to anything like, you know, what do you do when you go to a college or an art school? There's such a thing as financial aid. I don't know. How to, and I, I sometimes think if I had gone to art school, would I have developed uh, my artistic self more and would I where would that have led me um, or would I just would have been overwhelmed and I would have realized I didn't have the stuff that I needed because I, I still you know to me the greatest thing about working in comics is 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 the art when I get the art on a story for the first time that's the moment when I'm 10 years old again you know yes. where it's like oh look at that that was in my head and now here it is 
That's an incredible thing. And that awe never goes away. Yeah. And that's the first emails I open the minute I see an attack. Yes. I'm, like, I'm in there immediately. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's and that's the great thing about what we do. You know, the the uh, in order to do what we do, and not just in comics, but in, in writing and creativity in general, you have to keep that awe and that innocence of a child. Yeah. You know, you may be using it to to express very adult things, but it's still coming from that awe and innocence and looking out at the world with those eyes, you know? Yeah. And which is a great thing, because a lot of people lose that really early on in their lives. Yeah, I guess that's what people read for, isn't it? Is maybe to bring that back. It's that little yeah. moment, you know. Because yeah. I mean, we we get paid to entertain other people and their thoughts, don't we? You know, when you think about it, you know. So yeah, maybe, maybe it's a useful function in that regard. You know? Well, it is. I mean, as you know, as a culture, we we are addicted to story, aren't we? Mm -hmm. You know, we everybody loves story, uh, but I often I think about what we do though. And sometimes when I take a half step back and I think about the fact that I'm sitting around, first thing we're doing is we're just making shit up, right? <laughs> That's our job <laughs> is to make shit up. And then after we make it up, we start to figure out all the rules of what we've made up and 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 the psychology of these characters. And well, he can't go and do that because that's not a lot. And, you know, if you just remove it for a bit. It's sort of like the definition of insanity. You know? <laughs> we're like in this complete imaginary world and we're obsessed with every detail of it, you know, and I wouldn't have it any other way. And what's odd, though, is although it's imaginary, sometimes it's right and sometimes it's wrong. I mean, that's the oddest thing. It's like musical notes. I mean, musical notes are just an arrangement of notes, but yes. it's kind of like a secret code that they're in the right order sometimes and it works and you have yeah. to figure out the key, don't you? And it's the same with the story, isn't it? You just assemble the words in the right order and you get something brilliant or something terrible. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm always fascinated by that moment when it goes from terrible to brilliant because I'm sure you've had those moments when you're working and I'm looking at what I've written and it is just complete gobbledygook. It's just falling apart at the seams. It makes no sense. And I always, it's like a camera lens. You know, when you're turning the camera lens and it's all fuzzy, it's all fuzzy. And all of a sudden it gets clear. And I can never find that moment, you know, when it goes from crap to something <laughs> good. And I don't, how did that happen? I don't know, but I, I made the leap. Somehow it makes sense now, whereas before it was nonsense. But that's what I like about what we do. I like the mystery of it. And, you know, we, I mean, I've never really considered it until you bring it up, you know, but it is odd that what is the difference between a good story and a bad story? Because it's not just subjective, because generally the populace will decide something is good or bad as well. Don't they? Most people agree on what works and what doesn't work. It's a very odd thing. It's almost a spiritual thing, isn't it? Something just connects with people on some level. It is. I, I, I've often said also that, you know, we, we create what we create, but once we release it into the wild, it has nothing to do with us. It's this, It's between the story and the audience, when I think of some of the stories that I've done that have become, you know, the most successful and get reprinted and reprinted and reprinted, they're not necessarily my favorites. They're not saying they're not good, but I have other stories that I absolutely love that maybe they went out when, you know, I still love them. Yeah. But the audience decided this is what we like. Yeah. So, you know, there's chemistry, not, it's not just between the creator and the audience, but literally between the story itself and the audience. The story becomes separate from us. We pour all of our deepest, darkest, most, you know, uh, most passionate selves into these stories. So it's completely personal. Mm -hmm. But then when we let it go, it becomes something independent of us that interacts with the audience in its own way that has nothing to do with us. Yeah, that's interesting because sometimes even stories can be five or 10 years too early, can't they as well? You know, like- Yes. You know, sometimes you can hit on something. It's a bit like being too late sometimes, isn't it? If you're too early with something, the audience isn't quite there. And then you, it gets discovered a little bit later on. Have you ever found that with your own stuff? Yeah, a, a lot of times, you know, there are things that I've done where they, they go out in the world and either the response is, eh, okay, or it's a shrug, or they don't even like it. Mm -hmm. And then I just, you know, years later, you know, 15 years later, I'm at a convention. And all of a sudden, everybody's coming up with this one particular book or this one particular yeah. run. And, and I don't know where it's coming from. I mean, I think about, I did, a, I did a run on the Spectre for DC in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. And when that book was coming out, at least what I saw, people did not like it because I felt like people either wanted Hal Jordan to be Hal Jordan again and be Green Lantern, yeah. or they wanted the, you know, they wanted the classic Spectre who was going to turn into a, into a giant cheese grater and great people to death, you know? And this was not that. And this was a very sort of metaphysical slash spiritual series about Hal's redemption. Yeah. And I see a lot of just negative stuff, but I loved it. You know, every once in a while you get the opportunity to work on something where it provides you a framework to really talk about everything that matters to you mm -hmm. in that moment in your life. And that was one of those series that did that. And then, you know, 15 years go by or 20 years go by and everyone, people are coming up to me with, with the specter. 
Yes, how much it meant to them, how it touched their heart, how it opened their minds, you know? So when it was coming out, I wasn't seeing it. And yet, you know, I think, it all, you know, on the flip side, is I think some of it has to do with who's reading it when. Yeah. So, we, you know, it's coming out and you're hearing from some 25-year-old guy who's reading it, who's who's being dismissive of it. Mm-hmm. But maybe some 14-year-old kid who's, is right, or reading it, who's not writing reviews, who's not writing letters to comics, yeah. but it's changing his, his life and blowing his little mind, you know? And now that guy has grown up and he comes to tell you how that book affected him. And that's always a sweet thing. It's a funny thought, isn't it? You know, when you actually think of the physical copies of what you write, out there in the world it's quite a crazy thing isn't it even even a low run on something is still tens of thousands of people you know yeah getting something, yeah it? and it's, and it's yeah. quite amazing that it's something they read after work or during school or whatever you know all over the world yeah i know that, that you know when i when i started going to more international conventions you know because as i always say to people i sit alone in a room and i play with my imaginary friends and i'm in this room all the time alone you know and then you go out into the world and you realize oh wait people really read this stuff yeah and then you go to another country and some guy in Italy or Greece or Mexico walks up to you to tell you how much this work meant to him, you know, and it's really, it's astonishing. It's really astonishing. You know, just one person saying that you feels like your whole career is worthwhile. One of my kids pointed out that I'll, I'll sleep maybe eight hours or something. I'm working maybe 10 hours, which only leaves that tiny window of about six hours where I'm in the real world. And she says, if you think about that, you've spent most of your life in a fictional reality. You know, I hadn't actually thought about it until she pointed out. It's really true. It's really true. And even my approach to, quote, reality yeah. is pretty out there. So I don't know <laughs> how much time I ever actually spend in the reality that most people think is reality, you know? <laughs> Do you know what? It's working so far, though. It's good. Yeah, it really has worked so far. Yeah. <laughs> but, so your mum and dad, you know, like in the house, I mean, was it an artistic house? It sounds like you guys were a very regular family, you know, like. No, working class, you know, um, neither of my parents went to college. My father didn't even finish high school. What, did um, they do? what careers were they in? Your- my father worked for the city of New York for uh, the parks department. So like if you went into a park, he was the guy that was shoveling the snow and raking the leaves. And if you wanted a basketball, he gave you the basketball, you know. So uh, and my mother worked. She was a switchboard operator back in the days when they still had switchboard operators. I love that world. It makes me think of Billy Wilder movies or something. It just feels like. Right. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. Who was the last switchboard operator? Who was the last one? Right. That's right. That's right. So, no, like I said, every and everybody I grew up with was just, you know, a bunch of working class kids that lived in an apartment building, you know, no elevator, walk up apartment building. Um, and uh, and it was it was you know for what it was, it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what, you know, like, what did they think of this? Then were they like, what, what's going on here? When you yeah, they didn't have a frame of reference. You know, they really didn't. Um, you know, I think it was you know weird for like I never stopped reading comics either. You know, I I expanded out and started you know read books and great 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 literature, but I still always had a comic shoved in my back pocket, you know. Um I, I don't think they ever quite got that. And then, you know, uh so again, my big goal. So I played in rock and roll bands for years. So all right, you don't want to go do this or that. You want to play rock and roll and now what are you gonna you're gonna write comic books now? <laughs> so I don't think they ever got it. They weren't negative about it. Yeah. They weren't like, you know, I, well, you know, the, the mantra I always heard as a kid, if you got a job working for the city of New York, like my father had or my mother had for the state, you got good benefits. You got medical. You got you should go be a teacher. That was the mantra of my childhood. Be a teacher, because then you get all these benefits and you get time off. And I think I took one education course in college. And I was like, I'm not doing this because um, I always knew what I wanted to do. I would say God didn't make me good at very many things. So I had very little choice. I had to go be <laughs> creative. And I also had very, very low tolerance for that real world we're talking about. Yeah. You know, sometimes because I needed money, I'd go take some temp job. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they'd stick, you know, oh, they'd say, work in publishing, you know, and they'd basically stick you in an office collating paper for two days. And by day two, I'd want to jump out the window. <laughs> you know, I, I remember saying to a friend when I was 14, saying, I am never going to work in the nine to five world. I knew it. I just knew it, you know, in my soul. And thank God it worked out that way, because I don't know what would have happened to me otherwise, you know. 
So, you, I mean, you must have been into, you know, 66 psychedelia, you know, you're, you're playing in your first bands and everything then, round about the time Beatles kind of are hitting well, back. Yeah, I, yeah, but I was, I was, in, so I was in, like, so, you know, when, when psychedelia, the summer of love, I was 12 years old, so I was not in San Francisco with flowers in my hair. <laughs> I hadn't even hit puberty yet. But, but then as I get... Though, were you picking up the albums and everything at that oh, point? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Or... Absolutely. Yeah, and you, absolutely. you started your first band in school, though, didn't you? I mean, so you... Yeah, well, yeah, I probably started playing at like 13, 14. Yeah thereabouts you know started writing songs around 15 and then played in bands regularly till my early 20s and then there was a transition period there where i was playing in bands i was also doing rock and roll journalism writing reviews and doing interviews and trying to break into comics and writing short stories that i couldn't sell and just juggling all that stuff and uh i think in the end i made uh, you know it wasn't a conscious decision my at one point my band broke up and and the writing was taking off and so i just continued to follow that path. Yeah. When I look back, I still love music. I still play. I still write songs. I still sing. But I don't think I had the nervous system for the rock and roll lifestyle. You know what I mean? I, I say only half jokingly, I think I might have ended up dead in some hotel room somewhere. You know, I don't think it would have worked out well for That's me. That's when you become a legend, though. That's when you become a legend. Right. Yeah, I, I, that kind of legend I can pass on. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But it's funny because I always thought you looked like a music guy. You know the way some people look like a footballer or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, some some people just have a certain look. I always thought you looked like a music journalist. And then I was quite surprised when I found out you had done this as well. But you, you just you have that look of a music guy, you know. And and I think that's the thing you brought to comics. You brought a different kind of vibe, you know, because all the other American comic pros I used to see had glasses and a beard. And they were always mm -hmm. quite chunky. They looked like farmers, kind of, you know. And I always, thought, I always thought that you looked like a guy who'd be working for Rolling Stone or something. You kind of had that vibe to you. And oh, that's so I was funny. Amazed. I found out that's that's what you did. So I mean, what, how long were you doing that? Like the the music music reviews and so on. That's a really, you know, it's it's so hard because it all blurs together. Maybe I don't know, not more than probably three years or oh, so. Oh, that that small a time, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think. Probably three, yeah, I would say three years. It was it was simultaneous when I was playing music. It was it was a great bridge because I always liked to write. Yeah. So write about music. And you got free albums. Yeah. And you got sent to free concerts and you got to interview cool people. And you know, and um so it was a great thing. And I I've told this story before, but the thing that stopped me, this is another kind of what if in my career path. I I I'd gotten in the door at Rolling Stone and I was writing some reviews for them. And um I, I wrote a review of a Grateful Dead album. It was called Grateful Dead Go to Heaven. I don't know if you remember that album. They were all in white suits on the cover. And and this is my own immaturity. But I had a lot of friends that were really into it. Deadheads were, were like more hardcore than comic book fans. I mean, really, really <laughs> hardcore. And so I think I had more of a problem with the dead culture, which I don't know why. I look back now. What do I care? Who cares? Everybody like what you like. I don't care. But I was in my early 20s and I had that, you know, that kind of, arrogance and, and cynicism going on. And so I wrote this dismissive review, shall we say, of that album. <laughs> um, I always try to say something nice, but the guy that I praised was their keyboard player who wasn't really a part of the band, you know? Yeah, yeah. And one day uh, I get the mail and I get this envelope from Rolling Stone and it's a stack of letters, a big stack of letters from people who have now read this review. Now, if we're sitting around just privately and we're having opinions and, you know, I hate this movie or I love that album, whatever it is, that's one thing. You know, you're, and you, you forget when you put that in print and you put that in print in Rolling Stone, yeah. that has an impact. Mm -hmm. So I'm reading these letters and it's as if I wrote something in Rolling Stone about your mother. You know <laughs> what I mean? They were so, they weren't even angry. They were wounded. They were hurt. They were sad. And I relate to it because, you know, I'm passionate about the people whose work I love. Yeah. And if I see something, you know, where what are you, how can you say that about John Lennon? I love John Lennon. What are you talking about? You know? So I read that stack of mail and I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't care. I would, I'd rather be the guy, you know, sending my creations out into the world and being yeah. criticized than the guy sitting back and critiquing. Now, let me add to that. I have great respect for good critics, for people that are really intelligent and insightful. But for me, in that moment, I said, I don't want to do this. And I stopped. It was like cold turkey. I'm done. I'm not writing anymore. Of and this that was stuff. your last one? You never that was my last one. Never did another one. It's a weird thing, isn't it? Because you will always get more of a laugh from a cruel one, though, won't you? you know, and, and that is your job, kind of, as a writer as well, to get the laugh a bit, isn't it? You know, when you're doing criticism. So well, especially, you know what, I think when you're younger, when you know, I was younger, yeah. it's that sort of like the snarky thing is very cool when you're younger, you know? Yeah. 
Uh, I don't think it's as cool anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking the other day. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, like, I even feel that online. You know, like, I'll go and see a movie that I hate. And I'm just about to tweet how much I hate it, and I'm like, "What am I doing?" Absolutely. Yeah, I don't. I will not. I will not do that online because the other thing is, you know, as you get older and as you actually work at this business of being creative, yeah. even that thing that we think may be the worst piece of crap ever made, you know, someone bled to make that thing happen. Yeah. And we also know from our own experience that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Yeah. Sometimes I sit and I create something with all my heart and soul and it just falls over and dies, you know, and someone else is going to go, look at that piece of crap. That's the worst thing I ever read. Yeah. So, you know, I'm I'm still as a, 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 an opinionated ass in private because I like it. It's fun to have opinions and bounce these things. Out. But I think in public, I, I for me personally, I feel like it's disrespectful to other creators as a creator. Yeah. to be knocking anybody's work in a public forum because I know how much hard work goes into it. Well, Michael Caine has a great line about that, though, you know, and he was saying it's so hard to be an actor. He said he hated actors who hated, who who slagged off other actors, you know. He said it's so hard to make a living doing this and it can fall over at any moment and your career could just be gone. He says, so the idea of another actor who knows how hard it is to put the boot in he said, mm -hmm. it's the worst. he said, you should know better more than anyone. And it's the same as writers, isn't it? Like, that's I'm the same. I'll bitch in private, you know, but like... Uh, yeah. About 10 years ago or something, I made a decision, yeah, I'm not going to do this anymore. I mean, it, it can get a laugh and a lot of retweets and everything, but it's still someone's feelings, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And if I do comment on anything, I try to do it in the most generalized way without specifically mentioning something. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Um, because, you know, like, I'll be sitting watching TV with my wife and I'm like, ah. You know? <laughs> but that's fine between us. It's not, it doesn't, but doesn't belong in a public forum. I think you can critique a trend maybe. You know, like, yes. I think it's weird. To, yes, it's weird exactly. To, for example, superhero movies used to have really brilliant directors for about 10 years. And then they started going for directors, you know, who were just young and would do what they were told sometimes. Still mm -hmm. great ones in there as well, you know. But I think that's a weird trend. You know, and I've, I've, I, I'll see that kind of stuff online. I won't actually name a guy. And right, say he's doing a right. Job or whatever, you know? Right, exactly, exactly, yeah, yeah. But, you know, that crossover with, with music in the 70s and comic books feels kind of like, you know, the way comic book movies kind of cross over into the comic world now that people move back and forth i felt when i was growing up when i would look at fanzines and so on you would see kind of cool music guys talking about marvel comics like really esoteric marvel comics and things like julian cope from the you know the teardrop explodes mm -hmm. but i remember as, as maybe just known in britain you know like he named his band after a line in a daredevil comic from 1971 you know you had uh angie bowie dressed up as black widow and all this kind of right. stuff and it felt like there was that crossover did it feel like that to you as somebody in the cold face of music journalism as well that well, it, some it, of these guys it, were reading it, it only felt that way for me personally you know because those two worlds were really important yeah. to me i remember although it's funny that you mentioned because i remember i don't even know what the article was about but it must have been somewhere in the early 70s and it was an article about marvel mm -hmm. or maybe it was about stan and whoever was being interviewed said you know Rock and roll and comic books are the only things that ever told us the truth or something like that, you know? <laughs> it was a very generational thing to say. Um, but, you know, for me growing up, there's a lot of truth in that, you know? Yeah. The rock and roll and comic books had a huge, huge influence on me. And did, did Marvel feel big on college campuses and everything? You know, was because we would always hear that, but I always wondered if that was true. You know, was Marvel being read by college-age kids and that slightly intellectualized version of the comic book fandom starting to emerge. Did you, did you have any sense of that on a main? Well, that was the, that was the mythology, you know. Certainly, um, growing up. But like I said for me, growing up, yeah, it wasn't that. I was the only, among my friends. I was the only one that would read a comic book. They weren't comic book fans. Once in a while, I would turn someone on to you. Say, "Got to read this. You got to read yeah. this." And maybe they'd get it. Maybe they wouldn't. But most people I know didn't read them. So I wasn't in a world where you know there were other people reading comics. It was very which is kind of how my wife always been my whole life. I have these things that I'm into and they're for me. They don't have to be for the world. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm very sort of singular and keep it personal. But you must have, I mean, like you said, you would push things onto your friends too. Cause I remember my whole life pals would be over at the house and I'd give them three comics away that comics I know I'll never see again, but I was like, you must read this. There's something right. quite evangelical about comic. Yes, fans. absolutely. Absolutely. I remember, you know, probably in the seventies, my girlfriend at the time and giving her a stack of Jim Starlin Warlock stuff. Cause that seemed like, so, you know, someone of my age in that era would like their brain would explode. They would get that. And, you know, she did, she read it, she liked it, you know, and every once in a while you'd get through with something, but I don't, I don't know if I ever converted anybody. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, that period then led into you working in DC, wasn't it? You, I mean, the first stuff I ever saw of yours was, um, you know, the horror shorts that were in things like 
how is the mystery and you know Madame Zanadu kind of stories and everything yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. Those little short stories. Um was that your first published stuff? Was yeah, was basically well, the very the very first thing I ever had published. I knew a guy from Brooklyn College. Uh his name was Warren Reese, and he got a job. He was in a, he was in a writing class of mine, and he got a job working at Marvel in the production department. Yeah. And he started selling stuff to Crazy Magazine. Remember Crazy Magazine? Yeah. So he said, oh, you should send them some stuff. And it was not not in my wheelhouse, you know, but oh, okay. I sent some stuff and I managed to sell something. And I got a check with Spider-Man's face on it. And it was like, (laughs) oh, my God, this is unbelievable. You know, and I hope that maybe maybe that would open the door to the comic book side of things. And it never did. And I sold them maybe two things. And that was the end of that. But it was the first time I was ever paid for piece of writing. And I always say, you know, Started at the bottom, you know, crazy magazine. And then I moved up to weird war tales, you know? Um, so, and, 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 you know, I remember being about 18. I had never seen a comic book script in my life. I wrote up a sample script and sent it off to Marvel yeah. and I, I got back and I will not say the name of the, the assistant editor that wrote back who went on to be a fairly well-known name. He must've been having a bad day. I got back a really unpleasant letter tearing my work apart in a very not nice way. Um, and then like a year later, when I was like 19, DC was doing this apprenticeship program where they were yeah. going to like take a group of writers, I guess, an artist and teach them the ropes and whatever. And I sent some stuff in there and I look back and I think how stupid and how arrogant I wrote a Justice League script to this day, you know, writing a team book, as you know, yeah. that's a lot of juggling going on. And here I am 19. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm writing a Justice League script, <laughs> but someone from DC wrote back to me. Uh, very kindly and patiently and went over things and explained some things. And just to get that feedback was amazing. You know, I didn't get into the program, but just to have, you know, as again, a, a working class kid growing up in Brooklyn, I didn't know anybody in the arts. Yeah. My, my best friend, he had an older brother who was a musician who like was in a Vegas lounge act. And that was the closest to the <laughs> arts I'd ever come. You know what I mean? And, you know, it, it, this just wasn't in my world, you know, so just even to get a letter like that was a really cool thing. And then so basically what happened was just some time went by and I'm, I'm playing music and I'm writing short stories and I'm doing journalism. I'm doing all this stuff. And uh, I thought, let me try again. So I wrote up some more samples. I sent them into DC and I got a letter back saying, you know, because again, I wrote a Superman story. I had an original thing, which was like the seeds of Moonshadow in a very fundamental way and, and, a, and a Plastic Man story. Um, why I picked Plastic Man, I have no <laughs> idea. I think, I think for the humor, I wanted to do something with a little humor in it. Yeah. And they said, you know, if you want to break in, it's Paul Levitz is buying stuff for these, these anthology comics, Weird War Tales, House of Mystery. I had never in my life read those comics. I didn't even know they existed. <laughs> I went out and I bought a bunch of them and I read them and I said, okay. So I, I, I put together, you know, a bunch of ideas. I sent them off to Paul yeah. and to Paul's eternal credit. Well, two things. One was he read them. That's an amazing thing. As someone pointed out to me years later, you know, it's amazing that he even read them because you know? <laughs> it's just, it just came in over the transom. You know what I mean? It was, I'm just some schmo. <clears throat> And I got a letter back where he eviscerated my stories. I mean, absolutely eviscerated them, criticized my typing, which was <laughs> which he was absolutely correct. You know, like, you know, it's whiting things out, writing things in the corner kind of stuff, you know. But at the very bottom, it said, please feel free to submit again. Right. Right. I still have that letter. I never got rid of that letter. Um, and, you know, to me, and it's so funny how people react to criticism. And and so I see this whole letter, but if, if it was like in a cartoon, it would be these tiny, tiny letters. And then you'd see, please feel free to submit again this big, because that's all I saw. Yeah. The door was still open. Yeah. So I submitted again. I got some more feedback and I thought, what the hell? I'm in Brooklyn. He's in Manhattan. Let me go up to D.C. I get to see the office. And I made an appointment. I went up to see him. I pitched him a bunch of ideas. He liked one of them. Mm-hmm. And he said, yeah, well, you go home and write it. And I also have a piece of paper that he wrote where he all his notes about how to do a script, you know, when I brought in the first script. And literally, I, I've said this before, but it's amazing to me now. No more than 5.5 panels per page. No more than 35 words per panel. Those were the rules for those for those stories on the, in those books. And I went home and I counted every word in every panel. <laughs> I averaged out all my panels and I went in with the rewrite on the script. And this was one of my favorite moments in comics. Paul shook my hand and said, welcome to the business. And he bought my story. Oh my God. That's so that was, that was a great thing. That was how I got in the door. Do you remember how much you get paid? I always remember my first yes, check. I, I do. I needed it, it, was, I needed it, so much. it was $13 a page. 
And, you know, they, you know, it, to me, it was, it, it was the same as giving me a million dollars, you know what I mean? Because I didn't really even care about the money at that point. Yeah. Yeah. They were going to like print a story that I wrote. Yeah. Yeah. That was an amazing thing. That was, amazing. Right, I when, right? I, yeah, when I got, a, I got a raise, I, I was working for them for about six months and Paul gave me my first full length story, which was a 22 page weird war tales after months of doing five, six and eight page stories, you know? 22 pages, and they raised me to $15 a page. <laughs> I lived on that money for two months. You know what I mean? It was like, it paid the rent, it bought me some pizza, it was great, you know? But then what happened was, then the DC implosion came. Right, right. So I had just gotten in the door, and then they had this huge collapse, and the first people to go out the door were the people that had just gotten in the door. So I got no work from them for about 10 months, I think, after that. Was that, was that 78, 1978, that about? Yes. Mm -hmm. That was probably around June of 78. I remember my band broke up and the DC implosion happened at the same time. <laughs> it was like, oh shit, I'm screwed now. You know? <laughs> it's funny, I thought Joe Orlando and those guys were in charge of those books, but was it, was it Paul? That was, that was earlier. That was right. earlier. Yeah. And then Paul took them over. And then when I got back in, yeah, and, and Paul, and then when I got back in, it was Paul was doing it. Jack Harris was another editor at the time, a really great guy who started buying. In fact, he's the one that got me back in the door. They were doing a book called Time War. Warp, which was science fiction it. stories. And first so I started selling. The first one covered them? The first one that made yes. covered Yes, them? yes. And a great logo, that twisty logo, you know. And then Len Wein came on staff. Yeah. And Len took over House of Mystery and Weird War Tales. And that's how I met Len. And, and Len, as I always say, was the first guy who really looked at my work and went, you have something good here. You have something special. I want to work with you and help you develop that. So he became my, my real mentor and a dear friend over time as well. So I started working with Len and that was, you know, what a great experience that was. I think he's the unsung hero, really, of comics, isn't he? In a lot of ways, like he had such a great eye for other people. He was a brilliant writer in his own his own way too. But like, uh, obviously, uh, you know, amazing creations and everything. But he, he brought in so many amazing people to the business. Yeah. It's kind of like Karen Berger did as well. You know, yeah. I think the two of them are two of the best editors DC's ever had. Aren't they? Right, right. And and I don't know if you know the linkage with Karen, but Karen was a friend of mine in Brooklyn. You know, we we, we just we hung out together before either one of us worked in comics. Oh, I, I knew yeah. you were friendly as adults, but I didn't know you were friends. No, 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 no. This is when we were, you know, she was, I met Karen, I was probably 21 and she was 17 when we met. So was she a comic book fan then? In the no, program? not at all. I mean, she I mean, she knew comics when she was a kid, but yeah. and she was not a comic book fan in any way, yeah. shape or form. She was a journalism major at Brooklyn College. Right. Uh, and we, you know, we hung out and had our fun times in Brooklyn. <laughs> and uh, yeah. uh, I got in the business. They started selling those stories. Yeah. And uh, Karen graduated from Brooklyn College with a journalism degree and was looking for a job. And so I was talking to Paul Levitz one day and uh, he was looking for an assistant. When he was he was editorial coordinator, aside from being an editor, meaning he was the guy that made sure the trains ran on time right, and yeah. the books were in and everyone got paid and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And he needed assistance. I said, well, I have this friend that just graduated from Brooklyn College with a journalism degree. And Paul was from Brooklyn as well. So I sent her up to D.C. He loved her and comic book history was the result. That's crazy. That is crazy. Isn't that great? This is why you can't go back and interview with the time stream. There's too many important things. That's right. That's, That's right. right. That's absolutely right. I love yeah. that. I didn't know that. You know? And that training ground, though, I mean, I don't know if you know, but in the U.K., the training ground for all British writers is 2000 AD doing these like right. three very similar short stories but you did you feel you learned a lot from you know sort of yes oh god I mean it's here. it's too bad that 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 isn't there you know people walk in the door and here give us your six issue epic now yeah. you know to have to telescope a story down to eight pages yeah and have a strong plot have a character arc you know what I mean to have emotional involvement and psychological involvement and all that and do it in six or eight pages, and especially when the way I started out and doing it with no more than 35 words per panel and an average of 5.5 5, 5 panels on the page. <laughs> it was an incredible way to learn. And, you know, you know my work. I run off at the mouth all the time. I mean, this, my pages are full. But what it's, you know, as Paul said to me in the beginning, learn the rules before you break the rules. I remember going in thinking, I'm going to be Steve Gerber. I'm going to be Doug Munch. I'm going to do all this great, crazy. No, because I didn't know how to do it. Yeah, you have to, you know, some guys are brilliant and they can walk in the door and do that. I needed to learn. I needed to learn. I think everybody does. One of the few people I've seen, there's maybe two or three guys who were just brilliant right away. Garth Ennis, weirdly, like he and mm -hmm. I, we're only a few weeks apart age wise. Whenever he started, he was brilliant right away. Great dialogue. Great. You know, just the storytelling was perfect. He was, he just had it, you know, but it's rare. I think a training ground yeah. for a couple of years doing short stories is, is perfect for people. It's a great thing. Yeah, no, I was not brilliant right away. 
And I guess yeah. those anthology comics don't exist anymore, don't they? Like, for some reason, they just don't seem to work in the modern climate. It's no. a shame there is and, no training ground like that anymore. And they sold, you know, what Paul used to say, these books sell, I have no idea who they sell to. I remember <laughs> him saying that to you, but they sell. So it was perfect because it was sort of like, I call it the vaudeville of comics, you know, in vaudeville, yeah. you know, you go, you do your little song and you dance. And who's watching? Nobody's watching, you know? <laughs> and it was great because if you failed, it didn't matter. Yeah. You know, it for me, it was all about, I call it was like my comic book college, yes. working with Paul and Jack Harris and Lynn and, and learning from those guys and learning in kind of a protected arena. Yeah. yeah. You know, I wasn't learning writing Spider-Man where everyone can point at you and tell you how awful your story was. You know, <laughs> you, were, you were working on these nice little stories, you know, and, it, and it's funny because one of the things I did with Len back then, uh, Len was looking for uh, ongoing series for, for Weird War Tales. Yeah. And that's when I came up with Creature Commandos. This goofy, you know, goofy little thing. Well, it's weird war. Monsters fight World War II, you know. And then, you know, I did what I did and I forgot about it. And here we are all 40 years later. And this is like gotcha. the ten pole in James Gunn's new universe. It's, hyster it's hysterical, you know. Did you know that was coming? Because, you know, James, no. it's, it's seven big announcements. And Creature Commandos is one of those seven big announcements. I know it was funny. No, I didn't. The, only, the, the, the day before it was announced, a, a friend of mine who's a comic book journalist, uh, emailed me because he had gone to some special press conference the day before. Right, yeah. And I was like, you want to talk to me about what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm very grateful. Let them do it and let them be very successful and please send me the checks. Um, but it was the last thing I'd ever expect, you know, to, to see that be the thing that they're going to pick up. And do you know do what something. I think I've never heard you, you say is like, what were you reading at that point? Because everybody has got something they're obsessed with that makes them really want to be a comic book writer. You know, for me, it was 1980s comics. You know, I was like, I love this so much. I want to do this as a career, you know. What were you reading that made you want to make that jump then? What was the... Uh, Just you know, sp it? specifically comics you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's sort of, we're talking, you know, in, in the 60s, it was Stan and Jack and Ditko and all those guys. And then the great thing was, as I got older, yeah. this whole new wave of guys came in. Yeah, yeah. You know, the Gerbers and Engelharts and Lynn and Marv and all those guys. And the comics got older as I got older. Yeah, um, so I, I loved all that stuff and Starlin stuff. And especially I have to say Steve Gerber. I loved Gerber's stuff because Gerber was like, even, even on his worst day, it was yeah. always interesting. And on his best day, it was amazing. And it was like, I would say he came in, he looked around, he, he bowed to the gods of Lee and Kirby and did go and then just started smashing everything in sight, you know? And, you know, if, if, if guys like that hadn't been doing work like that, I might not have continued to read this stuff. Yeah. You know, but they kind of made you go, oh, comics can be this and comics can be that. And, you know, I remember reading, you know, Englehart's Doctor Strange and, uh, you know, I was on my own spiritual path. And here was a Doctor Strange story that was really reflecting some genuine spirituality and mysticism. Yeah. And you can do that in a comic. That's great. You know, yeah. so the, the 70s really widened things, you know. Yeah. And Gerber in particular, when I think about it, I, I, I can see the, the links to yourself and the DNA, you know, like it's the intellectualism, but also the, the humor balancing it as well, not taking itself too seriously, you know. Yeah, and Gerber's stuff, especially in the 70s, had a lot of psychological and emotional content. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I love the man thing stuff that he did yeah. with Mike Plug and, and Val Merrick and all those guys. Um and that's the other great thing about this business. So, like, you know, I loved Mike Plug back then as a fan. And then years later, getting to work with Mike on projects, it's like, yeah. you know, you, you, your dreams literally come true before your eyes. It's a great yeah. thing. It's, yeah, I guess it's like being an actor, you know, who, you know, an actor in the 60s getting to, you know, appear alongside James Cagney or something, isn't it? It's like the people right. You up with, isn't it? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You when I think about when I the same job as them. Yeah. When I first started out, a lot of those guys I grew up with, um, like when I was a kid or still in the business, Ditko and Don Heck and all these guys, yeah. Gene Colan. And so here I am just starting out and I remember, and the, and the, Ditko was drawing for the DC anthology books. Right. Yeah. So when I'm writing, working for uh, uh, Time Warp, I think he drew two stories that I wrote, you know, and I wrote a Legion of Superhero story that he wrote, which I still maintain is the worst Legion of Superhero story <laughs> ever written. Um, and, you know, Don Heck, I did Aquaman with Don Heck. And it's like, you know, then uh, there's the part of this is I wanted to just go back in time and write better stories for those guys. But <laughs> what I've learned over the years is to respect who I was at whatever point in my career, because yeah. I know I was doing the best that I possibly could. And then I'm sure you've experienced it too, the amazing thing is that thing that from like 20 years ago or 30 years ago that you think was just the worst thing you ever wrote, someone comes up to you and said, I love this story. This story means so much to me. So I've learned to respect the guy that I was, you know, 
whatever issues I may have with the stories, respect, because I know I was always doing my best with the material. See, I, I, I find that people come up to me and say, you were right, this was terrible. This was, this, this was a bad <laughs> period. <laughs> well, if you ever read this Legion of Superhero Stories, I think you'll agree with me. And th did you ever get to hang out with these guys? Because I know... You know, Ditko in particular was a you know quite reclusive character. I have a great Ditko story. Oh, I met goodness. him once, yeah. once. This is again really early in my career, and he had just drawn some Legion of Superheroes story that I wrote, the one, the the one that that I thought was so terrible. But I didn't say that then, you know. And I'm in Jack Harris's office, or I walk in, and there's this guy standing there, and this you know just middle aged, regular looking guy, and it's Steve Ditko, and I'm like, you know, what you want to do is bow, but you can't. You try to be cool, you know. And it just so happened later in the day, as I was leaving the office, Ditko's leaving the office. So we go down in the elevator together and he's going the same way I am as we're walking up the block and we start to chat a little bit. And I'm thinking, I'm walking down the street and I'm chatting <laughs> with Steve Ditko, you know? And in my ignorance and naivete, I say to him, so would you ever do a Spider-Man story again? Oh my God. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand that you're not allowed to say this. Do you know what I mean? And he went basically, good afternoon, and crossed the street and went on his way. <laughs> but hey, I got to walk up a couple, a block and a half or whatever it was with Steve Ditko, you know? That's amazing. Have you ever heard yeah. the rumor that Steve Ditko, when he left Spider-Man in anger, you know, and John Romita came in, did you ever hear the rumor that he continued doing Spider-Man stories, but they just never saw print? No. This is one of those, it might be an urban myth, but they, I'd heard he did a hundred more issues that he just kept in his apartment and he and he wrote and drew them all himself for the next hundred, next hundred issues. That's like a J.D. Salinger thing, you know? <laughs> I, 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 You know, it's probably not true, but I really hope it is. I want that to be Because <laughs> it's, it's a great concept because that, right? Talk about art for art's sake. Yeah. I'm going to do the next hundred issues of Spider-Man. I don't care if anyone ever sees it. Yeah. What a cool thing. I love that. I love it. And so what was the, what were the offices like then? Because to me, they seemed a bit Wild west and everything, you know, mm -hmm. but they were also, it was all guys in ties and everything who worked in the offices, you know. So where are you getting paid on time? You know, was it organized or was it more disheveled? You know, what, what, what was the business no, like? You know, I think I think our images of, what, of that stuff is from the 60s. Right. You know, like Stan created this image of the Marvel bullpen is when yeah. most of those guys weren't even in the Marvel bullpen. They were home working, you know. So we have our image of what it is. So by the time I get to Marvel, yeah. the Marvel that I've imagined, whether it's the Marvel of the 60s or the Marvel of the 70s, doesn't exist anymore. It's the shooter era. It's yeah. a whole different group of people. Yeah. Um, but they were all, everybody was around the same age, you know, everybody was in their 20s, early 30s, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And it was a great atmosphere. And, and you know, DC, when I started, there was, was still felt very DC, very suit and tie, very quiet. Like when I was selling those first stories, it just, it was like Paul had all the books six months ahead of time and it was just very buttoned down. And yeah. and then as we got into the eighties, it kind of exploded more, you know, but uh, Marvel was always sort of a fun place to be. So your first experience, like going over to Marvel, you know, you're doing Cap and Defenders and everything, those very first books, once you leave DC, did it feel like a distinct company then when you went over, there was a different environment right away or... Yeah, I think it did. I, I think part of that was just um, the mindset from the from the from the top down. You know, Shooter was very into like we're Marvel, they're yeah. DC, and never the twain shall meet. So there was just that general mindset. Um, you know, again, for me as a freelancer, it was like I just want to tell a good story. I don't care yeah. if I'm telling it with Batman or the Defenders. You know. Mm -hmm. um, but there was definitely a mindset uh, about with the companies and a kind of a wall between the companies. Um, but I learned early on that it's all about being a freelancer and the operative word in freelancer is free, you know, <laughs> and I got to be free to, to, cause I made a mistake early on when, you know, well, first of all, I started at DC. So I love those guys over there. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to go to Marvel and suddenly hate those guys. You know, it's like some, that's some junior high school thing. That's not like a real thing you're supposed to do in the real world, you know? Um, so I, I always, and I would always, if I went up to Marvel, I would still, even if I wasn't working for DC at the time, I'd go visit my friends at DC. And by that time, Karen's working there and, you know, Andy Helfer and Lynn and all these guys. Um, so, um, but, but, you know, I definitely became part of the Marvel family, you know, and it feels like, oh yeah, this is great. We're, I work for, you know, you get this thing, you know, the stars in your eyes. I work for Marvel, you know, with a capital M and then, and let me let me preface this by saying, you know, a shooter gets knocked a lot. And I think anyone who is going to be in a position of power and authority at any company because of the decisions they have to make, they're going to alienate half the people half the time. Yeah. 
Yeah. I had good experiences with Jim and bad. And when I weigh the good and bad, the good far outweigh the bad. So I want to get that out front before I get to the next part, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, after I'm, I've been on, I was been on the, he gave me a contract. He paid me great money. He treated me really well. And then it reached a point where I felt like as my work was getting more distinctive, mm -hmm. that I was getting more pushback, right? you know, mm -hmm. and it, it just reached a point where we were not creatively connecting and, and suddenly you realize, oh, wait a minute, this is just a company. This is just a business, you know, and I'm a freelancer. I cannot identify with a company. And I learned that right from that moment on, it's like, I will never identify with a company. I'm not a Marvel guy. I'm not a DC guy. I will, I am loyal to the artists that I work with and to my editors, you know, to the creative people that I'm involved in. But the, the biggest mistake I think any freelancer can make is to be loyal to a company, be yeah. loyal to people. Because the company, I always think of it, and I, I'll write this story someday of like, is, this, is it okay? Is there something else you have to yeah, do? Or? Sorry, there's people coming in the room. I see oh, that's people. okay. It's my, it's my family. It's not, oh. it's not a surprise. You know? <laughs> it's not a home invasion or anything, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, no, we're yeah. good. We're good. No, don't worry. You know, the kids, oh, okay. the kids are just okay. creeping in. The, 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 we're, we've actually got a place around the corner that's got an 18 month renovation going on. So we're renting this house. So oh, like, okay. Uh, I'm doing this in the kitchen of the place we're renting. Oh, Sorry, we're in the saying. kitchen. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. No, you know, because just kind of what I was saying, the marvel that I imagined when I was a kid, yeah. it's not the marvel that I got to. And five minutes later, it's going to be another company. And, you know, it's Shooter's Marvel until Shooter's not there anymore. Then it's the next guys and the next guys. And I imagine, it's like this Lovecraftian beast. You know, the corporation part of it is, and it just eats people up and it spits them out and it eats them up. So you can't be loyal to that. Mm -hmm. Like, what is Marvel? You know, is, you know, the Stan and Jack Marvel stopped existing long ago. It has nothing to do with it. It's just a it's just a label that gets slapped on something. I don't even mean this in a negative way. It's just the way it is, you know. So I learned to be loyal to people, be, yeah. you know, and, and the same thing, too, you know, because the editor you're working for on Monday might be over at DC or some other company by Tuesday. And as I learned, I might be too. <laughs> you know, I've had, I've had times in my career where it's like, I am so busy and the phone is ringing off the hook and they just got oh, work so much work. I have to turn it down. And then there's a change at the top. Yeah. And suddenly the phone, there's no work because someone decided mm, you're not relevant to them anymore. Right. Yeah. You know, and that's always the reminder you are a freelancer. So, you know, uh, I, I try to, you know, always try to be working, not just working for different companies, but, you know, get into TV, work in pros, do this, do that, because, you know, you can't, you can't hang your hook or your code on any one hook. You just can't. But there's sometimes though, whenever you're in a working environment that it feels right too, doesn't it? You know, like, oh, absolutely. All, all the chess pieces are just set up correctly. You know, like I found my years at DC, I found really difficult when I was in my twenties. I just couldn't connect. And it's where I'd wanted to be my whole life. And the, the, I don't know, the structure of the company, the personalities that didn't work. And when I went into Marvel, even though I wasn't really a Marvel guy, it just sort of felt like I got on with everyone, you know. So the you chemistry, was right? Yeah. Too, you know, but where, again, that's the people. You know yeah, what I mean? That's yeah. the people, and it's not. It's it's not the company. It, it just happens to be that that group of people at that yes. time yeah. were the right people for you. It's, it's all yeah. about chemistry. You know, the whole you know life is about chemistry, right? And I guess it's top down, isn't it? So if the person in charge is somebody you click with then yeah. everybody he's hiring is going to be people you got on with too, isn't it? So so I found my few years at Marvel, I, I really enjoyed it. Just felt, you know, they were quite freewheeling Wild West kind of guys. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I've seen so many different versions of Marvel and DC come and go yeah. over the years, you know, yeah. that it's just, it's sort of like this kaleidoscope. And sometimes it's just what you say. Sometimes everything clicks. Yeah. And, and the other funny thing is when you've been doing it a long time and I see this thing happen where it's like, they forget about you for a while. Mm -hmm. And then something reminds them, and I don't know what it is, you know. And then suddenly you're working for them again, you know. It's it's it, and then they forget again. So you go to these guys because they just remembered, you know. It's it's a it's a very strange. I would say freelancing is like tap dancing on quicksand. <laughs> it's like you have to tap dance really fast so you don't sink, yeah. and you have to tap dance really well so they can go. Look at that guy; he really dances. So well, let's hire him, you know. Uh, it's a. I, I saw, I've said to my wife a couple of times. I said, "How have I done this all these years?" You know, when you think about it, the freelance life is an insane life. Yeah. And yet, I would not have it any other way. It's been an incredible, incredible life, and still is. You know. But what I love about your Marvel time as well, in that little period when Shooter was there, is you seem to be a guy who was always taking risks as well. You know, so so you weren't just taking the easy route. You know, you were off doing, you know, more unusual projects like Greenberg the Vampire. I loved. 
you know, like yeah. uh, Moonshadow, you know, all, all these things that you probably could have done any comic you wanted, but you had these personal projects you wanted to get out there. I should point out, I couldn't afford Greenberg, by the way. I stood and read it in a store. I was only a teenager <laughs> at the time, but I love it. I read it cover to cover in the store. Uh -uh. Oh, it. this was the graphic novel, because before yeah. the graphic novel, I had done a short uh, black and white Greenberg story in Bizarre Adventures. That was oh, the I first know, one. I, I, I never saw that. Is that yeah, yeah. That yeah, actually, I don't, I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago, they put out a new edition, which had the 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 graphic novel and the short story in it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that was the thing about the 80s, though. Yeah. The 80s thing started to crack open in a different way. And Epic uh, Epic started. And, you know, and there was yeah. like a specific comics was out there and creator own stuff was coming in. Yeah. And I looked around and I was like, well, I don't want to just be doing this stuff. I want to, you know, and and it was it was it was a great thing to do, because as I've often said, you know, being stepping out of that world and stepping into something like Moonshadow. Yeah. I was no longer, quote, writing comic books. Mm -hmm. I was writing. Yeah. And it changed me as a writer. Now, whatever whatever blinders I had on about writing comic books, most of those were my own. The company didn't put them on me. I just, you know, you grow up and this is what you do within the parameters of a comic book. And even though, yes, my, my stuff might have pushed and was a little different because I was looking at guys like Gerber and, and, and Engelhart, and, mm -hmm. but completely stepping out of that and creating something that was my own from the ground up just... Yeah. They were, it, it, it didn't extend the walls, it just exploded the walls and there were no walls. And then I could step back in mm -hmm. to Marvel and do, I couldn't have done Craven's Last Hunt if I had not done Moonshadow first. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, I totally get that. And you're actually good one, I guess, editing as well, who was open to the idea of the, the more unusual projects. So it probably, was it was it a tough sell, you know, or you know, to sell it into the company? Moonshadow you're talking about? Uh, for, for Moonshadow or, or Greenberg, you know, did... Did guys like Archie support this from the beginning, or, or were they still? Oh, that's a, it. Was it was interesting how they they came about because I like I said I had done this short Greenberg story. Danny O'Neill was editing Bizarre Adventures, and yeah. you know it was called Bizarre Adventures. And I I'd actually started Greenberg years before as a short story, as a screenplay. So I had these characters. I had lived yeah. with them, and I pitched it to Danny, and he loved it. And Steve Lealo drew it, and it was it was wonderful. And what what I, the lesson I learned right there was that all of a sudden people in the office were coming up to me to tell me how much they liked that story. Yeah. No one had, no, it really hadn't happened before. And I, I didn't realize it till later. It was because it wasn't one of those characters. It wasn't me trying to filter myself through Captain America or the Defenders. It was just yeah. my characters, my world, and my voice. Yeah. And so what happened was uh, I was at the end of a contract with Marvel, and <clears throat> DC wanted me to come back. Karen was there at that point, and I talked to Karen about Moonshadow. And um, and she wanted to do it. They offered me a Swamp Thing. Marty Pasco had left Swamp Thing. Um, and I think they offered me Justice League. So it was real, very exciting. All my favorite stuff, you know. And uh, but I was at the same time, I was kind of, I was happy at Marvel. You know, I would be would have been great to work, go back to D.C. And, you know, Lynn wanted me back. But so I went to Shooter and I said, so I, I, I want to renew my contract, but I want to um, I have this thing called Moonshadow that I want to do. And I I, love, I want to do a Greenberg the Vampire graphic novel, which I had pitched before then, and they said no. But because I was renewing my contract, they kind of threw that in to sweeten the pot. Right. And the shooter read my Moonshadow outline and said, well, that's an epic comic. Go talk to Archie Goodwin. And we went off from there. That's amazing. And yeah. like, uh, how did the audience respond to it? You know, because I, I loved it, but this is before the internet, you know, but I, I got the impression that stuff was kind of beloved, you know? Did it you was, that well, Greenberg, you know, at the time, I don't know, within the within the business, people really liked it. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I don't remember any big response from out in the world because it was really different. Moonshadow had a great response, yeah. at least whatever response one could glean in those days, you know? Moonshadow yeah. was very, very well received. And it was the first time, like I said, I felt like I was finding myself as a writer, and I feel like maybe the audience was finding me as well at the same yeah. time. And I always wondered because, you know, you went off to DC again to do Justice League with Keith Giffen and everything, but at the same time, maybe a year or so later, you had um, Craven's Last Hunt out with Spider-Man. Was Craven's Last Hunt something you wrote before you left Marvel, but it just took a while to draw, or were you doing both simultaneously? I was actually, I was I had left Marvel. I'd gone back to DC. Yeah. But um, what happened was I have to, you know, the chronology sometimes gets blurry because it's yeah. been a while, you know. <laughs> so um, when I went back to D.C., Andy Helfer actually hired me first to wrap up the Detroit Justice League. I did like six issues of the, and, you know, killed off some characters, wrapped that up. Uh, I had no idea that we were going to go on to do the other Justice League. At the same time, Shooter had left. Tom DeFalco had come in. Mm -hmm. And they approached me about getting back together with Mike Zeck, who I'd worked with on Captain America. Mm -hmm 
to 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 do spectacular Spider-Man. And I, and it's too long a story, but I'd had this hero comes back from the grave story in my head for five years at least. And so I put it together as a Spider-Man pitch, pitched it to them, and they liked it. Um, and so that's how that started. And then we went off and started Justice League at the same time. So what I realized, I didn't realize till years later, looking back, I was writing one of the darkest stories I ever wrote. Yeah. And this like funny stuff with Keith at the same time. That's why I know? love I love the fact that you've got that range, you know, because that was a genuinely funny comic, wasn't it? Like Justice League was like, I mean, it was a great, that, that first year is like a proper hardcore superhero plot, you know, but it's also, yeah, you know yeah. Like? Love it. Yeah, yeah. And the longer we went, the the less the superhero plot became important <laughs> to us. But I, I and Kevin McGuire was, you know, I mean, it's incredible to think Kevin was doing a monthly book at that point, you know, because he's he obviously slowed down as time went on, you know. But he's amazing, you know. And it was yeah. one of those times the stars aligned, wasn't it? And there was just all the right people were working on that book, and you had to help at editing it. Who's such a quirky, distinct view of comics as well. I always loved it's, that. It's what you were saying about, you know, when you went to Marvel and the chemistry was just right. It all comes down to chemistry, you know, writer, artist, chemistry, uh, writer, artist, editor, chemistry. Yeah. And I give, you know, a lot of credit to Andy because who would have thought to put these three guys together? And how did you that know? happen? I mean, how, how, Keith, did Keith, Keith want somebody? Keith or? wanted to do the, Keith was like hot to do the Justice League. Right. right. The original plan was he was going to write the Justice League. Yeah. Uh, uh, he hadn't, you know, he'd been plotting before, but he had never, you know, been the writer before yeah. and i think he basically got cold feet right and andy who it turned out andy and i discovered after we met at dc that we literally grew up across the street from each other which is an amazing thing we didn't know each other at the time but literally i could walk diagonally across the street and be at andy helfer's apartment building you know? but andy you know so he asked me do you want to do this you know yeah. you want to dialogue over keith's plots and i i still remember i was on a plane going somewhere and reading keith's plot and thinking this guy doesn't need me this is so good. You yeah. know? But Andy really wanted me to do it. And Keith really wanted me to do it. And Kevin, I don't, that, that's like Andy's a magician. They, they pulled Kevin out of thin air, yeah. you know, and offered him this major book. Kevin had never done anything major before. I'd never heard of him before this. No, he, neither had I. Artist, yeah. Neither had I. And he was, you know, it, and I say, and, and, and I mean it, if Kevin hadn't drawn that book, we might not be talking about it today. Yeah. Yeah. Because... It was his expression of what those stories were, his ability to do acting on the page and acting and reacting that made the whole thing gel, you know? So um, we have no control over these things, you know? You can't make chemistry. It either happens or it doesn't. And I've said before, I've had projects where I think, I've done a really good job. Yeah. The artist has done a really excellent job and you put it together and nothing happens. Mm -hmm. And then other people you work with, first page, first panel, you're off like a rocket and, and you can't create that. What was the technical side of it? Just to get geeky for a minute. Like how did it, did it start with uh you know, was it a two page outline or something that then get broken down or did Keith, Keith actually lay it all out? Yeah. Keith, cause it was, if you remember, if you look at especially in the early books, Keith was plot and, and breakdowns. Right. Yeah. He would draw a mini comic. Right. He would draw a 22 page mini comic. Cause you know, in this very sort of kind of, Harvey Kurtzman sketchy kind of way, but with yeah. Keith, storytelling is so clear that yeah. even when he's drawing in a sketchy way, everything is crystal clear with kind of like Kirby with, you know, little, some notes in the margin, a little right. suggested dialogue here. And the great thing about the book was as we got to know each other creatively, mm -hmm. I had the freedom to do whatever the hell I wanted, basically. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Keith would provide a rock solid foundation. I didn't have to face, the great thing for me was I never had to face the blank page mm -hmm. because there was always something either to go along with or pull away from, yeah, you know, and, and, you know, in dialogue, and that's how I came to understand kind of Lee and Kirby a little bit better. You can do a lot in dialogue to completely change a story, to add whole entire plot lines, character arcs, all this stuff, all through the dialogue that, that's not there. Well, a lot of guys, and I've had that experience, you mess with their plot. Mm -hmm. They're not happy. <laughs> Keith was great with it. You know, he would see, he would see me screw around with something and yeah. he'd pick up on that. And the great thing about Keith also is, you know, we didn't really talk about the stories, but if we did, it was kind of like, I'm going to do this, this, and this. And by the time Keith did the plot, it was something else entirely. Yeah. So I often literally didn't know what was in the book. And this is in the days of FedEx. So yeah. the FedEx man showed up with the little Keith comic book. <laughs> I, I would write, I wrote that book very spontaneously. It'd take me a couple of days at most to do the dialogue. And my job was to get these guys talking to each other. Right. And through the dialogue, discovering more about the characters, you know, and and it was just something magical that happened. The first six months, I wanted to quit because it was too much fun. I didn't think 
And this is this this isn't work. This is fun. I should they shouldn't pay me for this. You know, <laughs> finally I woke up and went, dummy, this is a great gig. Shut your mouth and keep working, you know. <laughs> and then it was five years of Justice League, Justice League Europe, Justice League Quarterly, spin-offs, you know, with Mr. Miracle and Martian Manhunter and this one and that one. Yeah. So it really consumed, I'd say, probably 80% of my work for five years. It, it was a great run though, you know, and it was actually it was a really exciting time as well, wasn't it? Like, you know, Crisis had happened, Marvel and George had done an amazing job on that. And there actually was the quality creators to back it up, which is quite unusual, you know, to have, to have that many brilliant guys all working at the same time where you could relaunch Superman, you had Frank Miller yep. on Batman, you know, Perez going on to Wonder Woman, you guys on Justice League. I mean, that was a hell of a lineup, wasn't it? I mean, nobody could afford to buy all the good books back then, which was crazy. You know? And there was a there was a lot of freedom. Yeah. It, you know, it wasn't top down. It wasn't like editorial dictating what the story yeah. should be. It was the creators yes. dictating what the story should be. And, you know, things changed over the years. And there was a lot more top down coming in as time went by. Um, yeah, it was a great time. And, you know, uh, Epic was there. And then, then, then uh, you know, Karen, that morphed into Vertigo at DC, you know. And so I was always, along with doing that stuff, I was always doing creator-owned stuff and, you know, working, doing projects with Karen. And even when I went back to Marvel in the 90s, and I'm working on Spectacular Spider-Man there, I had a thing in my contract that said I was exclusive to Marvel only for superheroes. Yeah. So if I wanted to do all my Vertigo stuff and creator on stuff, I could continue to work for Vertigo while I was still, you know, doing the superhero stuff for Marvel. That's cool. So Andy Helfer is a guy I never met, actually, but he always fascinated me because he was at DC for years. He always mm -hmm. seemed to do really good books. Like Anything Andy Helfer was involved in was good, like when he was writing The Shadow and everything as well. It was always great, you know. Um, but he hardly did anything, you know, there would be a book out every year or something and it'd be an Andy Helfer edited book, but he was there full time. And I always, DC was kind of, it still is a bit like that, isn't it? Where there's guys who you, you thought left years ago, but they're still in the company still. No, still he was there for, yeah, Andy was there for a long time. He must have, because I met him when he was an intern and that was like 1980 or something like yeah. that, you know, and he went on to be, I think, one of the best editors to ever sit behind a desk in that company. I, it was, and, it, I was just going to say everything was quality if you saw, saw his name. Yeah, was. yeah, yeah. And he was a, a great writer, too. Yeah, terrific. He didn't write a lot, you know, because he had a full-time job as an editor. But um, but he uh, was a terrific writer and just a great guy. You know, he was a, he was a, he and he was like the cliche of the Jewish mother. You know, she's going to he's going to get that work out of you. He's either going to pinch your cheeks or guilt you, but he's going to get that work out of you and he's going to take care of you. And, and you know, and he was just, you know, really, I always say when I talk about Justice League, it wasn't, you know, me, Keith and Kevin. It was me, yeah. Keith, Kevin and Andy. And it was really, really important. He was he was the center of that wheel and we it all turned around him. And Keith Giffen is a guy, again, I've also never met. And it's strange because most people in comics you meet quite quickly. But I've, mm -hmm. never, I've never even seen a picture of Keith. You know, like what kind of guy is... And I and I love Keith stuff. I've loved it since I was 10, you know. But what, what's, what's he like? What kind of guy is it? What is Keith like? If you meet Keith, Keith... Uh... It's a little bit of Larry... You're talking about, about curbing your enthusiasm. There's a little bit of Larry David in there because he's a <laughs> professional curmudgeon. <laughs> so if you meet him, you, you think, well, watch this guy. Just watch yeah. it with this guy, you know. <laughs> and underneath that, he's 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 a total softy. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. He's all. Uh, and you know, we were not when we were working together. You know how it is sometimes. You're on the you're on the assembly line. We weren't friends. Mm -hmm. We were collaborators. Yeah. We were much more intimate collaborators than we were as human beings. We would talk on the phone now and then. We'd see each other at the office. You know, always you know very cordial and very nice. Yeah. But we didn't. We, over the years, we got to know each other as we continued yeah. to work together. But back then, we didn't. We, we didn't people imagine you know it's like a comedy writing team we're in the same room yeah. i always say we worked in glorious isolation you know but keith is a great guy he's also one of the single most creative people i have ever met in my life oh he's a genius constant stream like the closest thing to kirby i think i've ever encountered in the sense of a constant stream of ideas yeah. yeah. You know, I, I always say when one of my kids, I forget which one, when they were little, they had a little bubble bear. It was a little plastic bear and you'd press the bear's belly and his head would pop up and bubbles would come out. Mm -hmm. And that's Keith. You <laughs> give him a squeeze and 10 ideas will come out. And if you don't like those ideas, squeeze them again. 10 more will come out and he's not attached to them. He'll keep he'll keep popping those. We were doing a story once. This is my favorite Keith story. This is back in, in that Justice League era. Yeah. And remember the Secret Origins comic? Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that bit. Yeah. Yeah. We were doing the secret origin of Nort, our silliest character, and also maybe my favorite. Mm -hmm. So we're standing in the hallway, and Keith, Keith starts telling me this idea that he has for Nort's origin. And he goes yeah. in detail into this whole thing. And I went, 
I don't like that. And he went like this, took a breath, and then just launched into a whole other version of the story, a whole new story on the spot, you know? And that's Keith. That's, that's amazing. I love that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you're going back and forth a little Marvel and DC, you know, you, you get Craven's Last Hunt out after that. You're moving between the two, but at the same time, there seems to be this move into other media as well, you know, like television starts to appear for you. You know, like what year were you doing the Superboy TV show? Was that? That was early, early 90s, yeah. Early 90s, yeah, right. before that I had done, the first thing I ever sold was uh, an episode of the 1980s Twilight Zone. I heard, I've never seen your episode. I'm going to have yeah. to track it down. Is it online? It's, Can I? I think it's on YouTube. Yeah. I think right. it's on YouTube. You know? How did that go? Because I mean, Twilight Zone is obviously everyone's favorite all time to television. Show. It certainly is mine. I realized, you know, it, what an influence it had on my perception of yeah. reality. You know what I mean? That I've carried with me my whole life. Yeah. Um, yeah you know, uh, I love the Twilight Zone. I, I, you know, I, I never set out to be a comic book writer. I set out to be a writer and I always wanted to do different things. Yeah. And and in those days, I would just write letters to people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Seeing oh, if you, you can crack up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what happened with the Twilight Zone was um, I, I I read somewhere that, that they were reviving the Twilight Zone and that one of the people working on staff was this guy, Alan Brenner. Right. Who's a great writer. I love Alan Brenner. Great writer, a great TV writer, great novelist. And he yeah. anytime he's put his foot in comics, he's written something brilliant, you know? Yeah. So I thought, okay, he's in comics. There's a door. And I wrote him a letter and I just yeah. said, Hey, you know, uh, what do you, and I, you know, I had a spec script that I'd written, you know, that I'd overwritten, I should say, and uh, sent it off to him. And he basically said, um, pitch me some ideas, you know? Yeah. And I, I think, I think I was in LA at one point, we met up in LA and long story short, one of the ideas that they liked, uh, one of the ideas they liked, but it was the end of the season. Yeah. And if, if we have another season, we're going to do this, we'll do this story. And they did get another season. They got canceled about five minutes into it, but they did get another season. And, and they bought my script and uh, it was significantly rewritten, but that's okay. That's yeah. fine. You got to, that's how you learn, you know? Uh, and in fact, Marty Pasco was one of the staff writers and he and his writing partner at the time were the ones that did the rewrite on my script. Yeah, so um, I and I love Marty Pasco as well, you know, like his Superman yeah. was amazing. Yeah. It was yeah. So, uh, so, you know, I flew out to LA. I walked, I got, I got to watch them film the episode and it was, it was, it was a great, it was a great first step to say that my first credit was the Twilight Zone. That's amazing. Even, even though it's not the Twilight Zone, it's still, a, <laughs> it's still a pretty cool thing. It's you know still what's a pretty amazing cool thing. Twilight Zone when you watch it now though, the fifties Twilight Zone is how universal it is. You know, the fact that grandmothers were watching it in the fifties and children were watching it, like, Sci-fi now has gone down this corridor, hasn't it? But it's kind of niche, and it's a certain mm -hmm. demographic that watches it. And it's guys like you and I are into it, but not not grandmothers. And what was amazing about Twilight Zone was it was like it was like watching Columbo. And anyone could just pick it up. And that's and right. The, the that's madness right. And ideas, but again, like Stan Lee, like Serling was, and Richard Matheson, and those guys, you know, were amazing at finding the human way into even the maddest story, weren't it? Yeah. And, uh, to, to get to write the 80s version of that must have been such a, a dream come true for any writer. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm one of my earliest TV memories is The Twilight Zone. I remember the very first episode I saw it. I must have been five years old. I shouldn't have been watching it, you know, <laughs> but it, uh, it it imprinted on my brain forever, yeah. forever. Yeah. That's, I think the world splits into Outer Limits guys and Twilight Zone guys, and I'm I'm a Twilight Zone. You know? uh, yeah, I, I, I'm absolutely a Twilight Zone guy. Yeah. So, and to me, it's it's, you know, to me, if I had to pick my favorite kind of story, there it is. Quote, real world story, yeah. regular guy, and then the universe just opens up and you realize that there is a lot more to reality than we've ever assumed. Yes. You know, yeah. it's perfect. And and I've talked about this before, but you wonder, like as a kid, was Twilight Zone creating my worldview? Mm -hmm. Do we come into life with a certain worldview and then we see the art that reflects that and awakens that thing that's already inside us? Mm -hmm. Is it a combination of the two? Which I think it is, you know? But I think I responded to the Twilight Zone because there was a part of me that knew that that point of view was true. Yeah. That, the, that, that quote, reality is really something far more than we could ever imagine, you know? And 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 um, that I can still watch those shows now. And they I think they hold up better than shows from like the 70s and the 80s, the black and white, oh, yeah. you know, the whole thing, because they're in black and white, they don't, they, they weirdly, they look less dated than the 80s Twilight Zone. Strangely, yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a timeless feel. It's like you're just, you're somehow watching a CCTV footage of something that actually happened. You know? <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Like, there's there's no directorial style or anything. There's no sort of flair to it. It's just meat and potatoes telling you the most wonderful right. 
Right, right. Well, sometimes they got into that nice kind of tilted camera, long shadow, German expressionistic stuff, you know, a little bit of Orson Welles crept in there, you know. Um, but I know what you're saying. That there was, but they, but that, and I think if the show had been in color, it wouldn't have worked because part of the reason why it's so damn creepy yeah. is because it's they're using black and white cinematography and shadows and they're depending less on budget and more on imagination. Yeah, yeah. One of my favorite moments scared the hell out of me when I was a kid was the Billy Mummy wishing you into the cornfield episode. Oh, yeah, yeah. When he turns the guy into the jack in the box. Yes. Yeah. Well, what do you really see? What you see is a shadow on the wall doing this, and for a second, a guy's face with a little hat on. But mostly, your brain is filling in mm -hmm. everything that just happened, yeah. you know? And, and your brain is far more effective than the best special effects in the world, you know? It's the same as the James Whale horrors and everything, you know, sort of back in the 30s too, isn't it? There's there's something weirdly historical about seeing it in black and white. Like you feel as if you're witnessing an event, don't you? Mm, that's you know, a great way to put it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's odd. It's a strange one. But yeah, I mean, that's like, I'm jealous as a writer that you got to do one of those. That's amazing. And there's yeah. always talk of bringing it back. There was a terrible idea somebody had a few years ago where they were going to explain in a movie what the Twilight Zone was. It was going to be the origin of the Twilight Zone. Can oh. you imagine them getting it so wrong? That like one of my friends was going to make a prisoner movie, you know, the Patrick McGoon prisoner TV show. Yeah, sure. And they were going to explain everything about the island and everything, you know, and it's like the beauty of these things was the mystery, wasn't it? it was exactly, the exactly. That it couldn't, it couldn't, you're, you're left with that gap for your imagination to fill in and yeah so then superboy comes along and superboy is a show i don't know if you know this but in the uk superboy show appears and it gets bought up by this company called b sky b right which is not anything to do with the bbc it's a tiny little satellite company who had a ton of money and they bought up all this stuff that then nobody saw because they only had twenty five thousand subscribers or something you know so i didn't see superboy when it appeared in lockdown my kids and I became obsessed with it, you know, like that's when you first saw it. Yeah, I'd never, I'd never wow. seen it until like two years ago. And, <laughs> <laughs> but your episode, uh, you know, you did some really good episodes, but that two parter you did, I absolutely love with Ron Eli. No, I didn't do that one. Not oh, like you're kidding. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's embarrassing. Well, that was a good episode. That's know? okay. They did it. I, I know, thought that was you. No, not that one. Mm -mm. You did a really it's, great. What was your great? Two I, the, I did two two parters. I did yeah. the one with the which is my favorite with Luther, where Superboy travels into Luther's dis, into his memories and lives yeah. out Luther's childhood and understands yeah. why Luther became Luther. That was a great one, and that's where you saw how good that actor was who played Luther as well. Yes. I loved that guy. He was. Great. Oh, he. I think he's like the best Lex Luthor there I, ever was. I he was amazing. He was great. Sherman Howard was his name, yeah. yeah. And, and if he actually had a good script, he was he was brilliant, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, and I didn't see him in a lot of things after that. He was no, actually in an he was in an episode of Seinfeld, actually playing really? one of Elaine's <laughs> boyfriends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what but was yeah. the other two parter in Superboy? Uh, the other two parter was uh, Bizarro. It was basically Flowers for Algernon with Bizarro, where he yes. to be human. It was called. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then the other one that I did was uh, called Into the Mystery, where Superboy encounters death. That was the and, girl with the flute, which was amazing. Yeah, 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 yeah. What yeah. was weird is I, I kind of had a weird feeling. It was you. I'd missed the credit, and then I checked it. And I remember you did Death playing the flute in one of your old DC horror comics from, like, 1980 or something. Oh, that's know? right. I never thought of that connection. That's really <laughs> funny. <laughs> but they were great, you know. And, and it felt as if the budget had gone up a little as well. I know Carrie Bates was doing season one and two, and he right. told me he was making it on, like, pennies, you know. But it felt like they put a little more money into it. Season in season two. three, I don't know I don't know about the budget. I know in season three, the first two seasons, were pretty much more kid oriented. Yeah, yeah. Season three, my friend Stan Berkowitz came in uh, as the producer, and he sort of revamped the show and made it more serious and a little bit more adult. I don't, you know, you look at them; they, they definitely did not have a big budget. You know, even if the budget went up, it still didn't go up much. You know, <laughs> um, but Stan Stan was responsible for a lot of uh, the good that came out of that show and those uh, in those last couple of seasons. And that's, we met because basically Andy Helfer and Mike Carlin were the DC advisors on the show. Right. And Stan was looking for writers. And I said, well, oh, he's done TV. He just wrote this Twilight Zone, whatever, blah, blah, blah. I talked to Stan. I did a, I did the, the, the death script for him. Yeah. He loved it and actually said, oh, could you come down here for six weeks and work with us? Yeah. So I worked on staff with them for like six weeks. Um, and uh, and Stan became a lifelong friend. And here's how the here's how the threads go. Yeah. So Stan finishes um, working on Superboy, and he's looking around for his next gig. At the same time, Marty Pasco, let's go back to the Twilight Zone, is now working on the '90s animated Spider-Man show. Right. 
Marty wants me to do something for the show. I talk to Marty. I say, you really should meet my friend Stan Berkowitz. He's a fantastic writer, you know? Yeah. Marty meets Stan, falls in love with him. Stan gets a job working on the Spider-Man show, which I never, and I don't think I even ever ended up writing for it. Maybe I did one, I don't remember. But Stan suddenly becomes this giant in the land, in the world of animation. And then he's working on all the Warner Brothers shows. All then the he's working on Justice League unlimited and he calls me up and says do you want to work on justice league and suddenly that opened the door for me on a 20 plus year career that i never planned on that's amazing and you know I was all these little threads your, your animated stuff that was is so great and that's why i was so happy when i heard you were doing superman red sun because you there's always nerve-wracking when somebody's adapting something you've written you know that's going to be the public perception of it. More people are going to see the TV right. movie than right. read the book. Alan Moore, I feel so sorry for because he's done these amazing books that are generally turned into not very good films, you know, and that's mm -hmm. what the public see. So, like, uh, you know, when it was you coming on, I thought this is going to be great. I always like it when somebody adapts one of my things and makes it better, you know. And Well, you know, I have to tell you, it was difficult because you have so much rich story in that thing. And you know, you had, we had what, 85 minutes to tell a story. Yeah, so absolutely. it was me and the you know two producers were Jim Krieg and Bruce Tim. We spent many hours on the phone, you know? <laughs> I said, it's like, you have this amazing giant tree and we had to kind of slice it down to a little bush, you know, <laughs> to get it to be an 80 minute movie that you liked it at all. I'm delighted, you know? Oh, I love um, it. But it was it was it was that was a difficult one to adapt because there was so much stuff there. Like I said before, every page. Well, there's a cool concept. Well, there's a cool concept, you know. So and the time jump is always a problem when you're doing something too, isn't it? Because the narrative drive is interrupted continuously. You can get right. away with that in three volumes, but yeah. it's a bit like the problem they have in House of Dragon, isn't it? The minute you do time jump in live action, people are slightly confused and everything, isn't it? You know, so right. it's a much more challenging thing to adapt, I think. Yeah, That's yeah. Yeah, well, I'm glad you thought it turned out okay. Thank you. I appreciate well, I that. I thought it turned out great. Really, really happy with it, yeah. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, Teen Titans, all this stuff. You did Scooby-Doo. You know, you've, you've done so many, so many yeah. things. But like, You know, you end up doing, like I said, you know, one of the things I like to tell my students is always be open to surprises. I had, no, on my list was never be an animation writer. It yeah. just wasn't there. I didn't, yeah. didn't matter to me. So I stumbled into this Justice League thing. And again, the first thing I did was Alan Moore, the, for the man who has everything, was yes. the first thing they gave me. Um, and then that door just opened and I uh, wrote on all these shows. And and that's just that someone calls you up and says, hey, you want to work on Be Cool Scooby-Doo? Well, <laughs> in a million years, that is not on my list anyway. But you always <laughs> think, well, that's interesting. I'll learn something. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it ended up being a great gig. I did like five episodes of that show, you know? <laughs> um and 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 so it's it's the it, and it's it's been a, it's been a great ride. And then getting to do these DC animated movies, I've done like I guess five of them now, and yeah. uh, it's really it's really been fun. It's really been fun. And also, you know, the minute you sit down and you actually start working on a half hour animated show, mm -hmm. you understand how much hard work goes into. You look at a show like Justice League Unlimited. Take me out of it because I'm I was just one cog in a wheel, and it was yeah. you know Bruce Tim and uh, Alan Burnett and all those guys and Stan and Dwayne McDuffie who were running that ship. Yeah. Um, what they got into a half an hour of an animated show in terms of plot and character and emotion. Amazing. I, you know, that show has gone, I've seen it over the years. It's stock has risen and risen and now people consider it a classic. Yeah. Um, and I think it's, I think it's one of the best versions of justice League ever done. Yes. It's great. It's really good. Yeah. It's funny. Cause uh, you know, that, that sort of whole period, you know, you're sort of massive in animation and everything, but you'll always be drawn back to comics, you know, like, do you find, I've always wondered if, animation because you can you know do reshoots in the same way you can do with live action do you have to get the script so perfect i've never done it you know that everything is like a swiss watch before you before you actually well there's more detail in an animation script usually than a, than a standard live action but script. more drafts as well are you doing are you doing like twice as many drafts in animation no sure no no it's usually you know for me as a, as the freelancer hired to do the episode it's you know three drafts and a polish is what it usually is and then, you know, it's always going to it's always going to go through somebody's hands because, you know, the director is going to come in and say, oh, we need to do this or that. Instead, right. I would see that. So um, but it's usually that's usually what it is. Three drafts and a polish. You know, we maybe like one of the shows we we're working on just now was maybe 50 minutes. But with edits, we took it down to maybe 43 minutes or something. Just taking mm -hmm. the hair out of it and make it a little pacier. And I think because animation is so expensive to do, I always thought people would be really wary of that and they'd want to make sure it was 100% perfect up front. So it's it's not as much pressure as it sounds then in terms of... Yeah, I think, honestly, 
the pressure is on the guys that are sitting there on staff. I've always been the freelance guy, not the staff right. guy. So they, yeah. you know, they're the ones that are dealing with, I always say like they have a season mapped out and they want me to do this one particular story that fits yeah. in this slot. Yeah. My job becomes, I have to give them what they want, mm -hmm. which is their vision. Yeah. And at the same time, bring as much of my own vision to the table. So I'm not just a robot regurgitating something that they want. Sure. The worst gigs I've had were the ones where it's so narrowly dictated that I feel that way, that I'm just mm -hmm. kind of typing somebody else's idea down. The yeah. best are the ones where they give you a lot of room to play. And was it nice coming back to comics again? But when it is so autonomous, isn't it? It's basically just you and your friend who has a pencil. Yeah, you know? yeah exactly. And that's the it, difference. Right? I always say when working on animation, and I and I love it. But I take, you know, it's like we have our personal vision hat. Even if you're working on Spider-Man, you know, we talked about with Craven. It's like, it was just, this is my story. This is my vision. And even, even if your editor is saying, what about this and that? It's maybe three guys. It's you and, and the artist and the editor. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. You know, what, working in TV and film, as you know, I have to take off that hat and put in my, you know, group collaborator hat. Yes. I'm yeah. part of a team. It's not, I'm not walking in. And now here is my vision of what Justice League Unlimited should be. No, it's their vision. I have to bring as much of myself to their vision. So yes. it's something you need. Uh, but I enjoy that too, because I say, what do I do? I'm, I'm alone in a room most of the time. So to, to get on the phone with Bruce Tim and Jim Krieg or Alan Burnett or all those guys, they're, the great thing with the Warner Brothers animation guys, they're all writers. They're yes. not just executives. They're yeah. writers. They know stories. So it's always a great thing. But that's interesting because there's got to be a narrative of consistency in an episodic show so that every episode feels like it's done by the same people, really, you know? But right. what's nice about comics, isn't it, is, you, you know, one of your scripts feels very much like one of your scripts. Like Craven's Last Hunt, you can tell if it, somebody should be one page of that, I'd know it was you. In a right. way, you can't always with film and television and so on. Right, that, absolutely. That, does, does that really pull you back then? Is, do you think that's the big drive, the big thing for comics for you? Yeah, I think it, you know, it's that for sure because you get to you get to leave your imprint and yeah. speak with your voice. And it also just goes back to what we started talking about at the beginning is that little chemical that drops in our brains and we love comics and that's all there is to it. And, you know, I've, I've worked in prose over the years and that's really great too, because then the whole vision coming out of your head is yours. It's not even an artist getting in the way, you know? Yeah. Um, but comics will always have that magic. And as long, you know, so many times, there have been times over the years where I think I'm done. I, I don't think I've said so much. I'm, I'm really done with comics. I don't need to do it again. Yeah. And then it's like, all it takes is the right idea to pop in your brain and you're off again. Yes. And you're excited again and you're 10 years old again. And it's how fast you can do it too, isn't it? Like a movie can take three years, yes. you know? Yes. Uh, that's if it's all going well. You know, a comic, you could have, your script is done in a week, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, wow, it might take three months to come out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it is. It's very, it's very immediate. And that's what I liked about it as a fan too. You know, that sense back in the days when you would write letters to the comics, this idea that now the internet, you know, you can connect with anybody. But I loved as a kid the idea that I could write a letter to a comic. Yes. And maybe you know, the guy that wrote it will read it. Yes. Yeah. Cool thing. You can connect with those people on the other side of the wall. What yeah. a cool thing. I think one of my favorite books of yours is what you did right after this, which is Seekers Into the Mystery, which I absolutely mm. love, you know? And it's a mm. book that I really liked when it came out, and then I read it 10 years later. Like we say, you sometimes you're at the right age for something, and I just mm -hmm. bought it, you know? And what I always think is interesting, I'd guess you must have been mid-40s at the time whenever you did that book. Probably, yeah. 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 Early, and early mid happens to writers about that age. You know, once you've had children, you've got married, you've had your children and everything, you know. And you actually, you start to be interested in different things, don't you? Like Kirby was suddenly interested in human prehistory, you know, the origins of the universe and everything. And that's when he's off doing his more out there stuff in the 1970s. And I've noticed that with everyone, once you kind of hit middle age, you suddenly start asking questions that you don't because you're on a treadmill before that, aren't you? You know, you're just like, okay, I've got to do school. I've got to get a job. I've got to get married, have kids. But then suddenly the second half of your life, you start to kind of turn in on yourself a little bit in a really interesting way. And I think sometimes that's the, a writer's best work starts at that mm. point. Although I, I have to say, honestly, those are the questions that always obsessed me. Yeah. And you could find that through Ryan, through all my work. Because yeah. in a way, these are the questions that obsessed me when I was 17. Mm -hmm. And what happens over time is that your experience deepens that perception. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, you know, Moonshadow is about essentially the same thing that Seekers is about, but in a different way. Yeah. Uh, you know, or if you read Brooklyn Dreams, you know, it's, it's the same search going on there, but you find, you find you're shining a light in different corners, I guess, maybe as we get older, you yeah. know, you go deeper, you go into different corners and you expand into it more. But you know, I think with any writer, if you look at their work over the course of however how many years, you will find the same things recurring 
over and over and over. And we don't realize in the beginning what our themes are. We're just writing. Yeah. It's like a Rorschach test. It's just the ink's plopping out of our heads, you know? And then one day you go, well, that's that's the 10th story I've written about a guy working out his relationship with his father. Hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> all, all my stories are about the search for meaning, one way or the other, whether it's yeah. psychological meaning, emotional yeah. meaning, metaphysical, spiritual. It's all about who am I? Yeah. And what is my place in the universe? And what is the universe? And what does this mean? But it's all about that search of meaning, whether it's personal or cosmic. Yeah. And I hope that as I go along, you know, you find better and deeper ways to explore those questions. But it's funny because when I think of like my age group of writers, you know, who are sort of like Garth Ennis, Warren Ellis, those guys, I don't feel this, but a lot of my friends do, the, the, this, this generation of writers. It tends to be kind of mocking spirituality, you know, mocking the idea of there being something beyond the physical and being entirely focused on the physical. And what's interesting mm -hmm. is out there, what I'd say the 70s and 80s writers were quite inward looking. They were more like, you, you know, there's something enormous inside you. You don't need to go out into the universe. There's something huge inside you. Would you say that that sums up? I think, I think that probably grew out of the 60s, you know, because the 60s was that, that explosion when it started with acid and led to, you know, the fascination with Eastern spirituality and... Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, for me, it really blossomed in the 70s. But yeah, I think that's very true. It was a very sort of, it was really an explosion of people kind of asking those fundamental questions. And, you know, simply, you know, the thing, well, those are the questions you ask when you're a teenager, and then you forget about them. And because yeah. you get a job, and whatever, I never forgot about them. Because <laughs> the, the minute you get an answer, the minute that door opens even a little bit, you have to walk through that door and see what's next and what's next and what's next, you know, and I had an experience when I was about 17, I was going through this whole, what does it all mean thing? And I had an experience where the universe cracked open and I had a vision of what it all was, you know? What and th uh, what happened? We've got time. We've got time. <laughs> it, it's, it, it, you know, if, if you read Brooklyn Dreams, I, I actually write about that whole experience in Brooklyn Dreams. But at the time, let us say I was under the influence of something. I will not say <laughs> what it was. And, but I had been under the influence of something before that. Yeah. And this answer never came, but it was just like that moment, if you have to call it a mystical experience, mm -hmm. when, you know, the meaning of the universe and who we are and who God is and who we are in relation to that yeah. and what it all means suddenly goes. Poof. And and it's not, I don't often talk about this in this kind of interview. Um, it, it, it It's not like, oh, I thought this or I felt that or I came to this conclusion. It's an experience where I became that. Right. Do you know what I mean? As yeah. opposed to yeah. I thought that or felt that I became that. Oh, I'm God, you're God. And the and this is an illusion. And the only thing that exists is love. That's a nice concept. Mm -hmm. But experiencing it mm -hmm. as a concrete thing is very different than discussing it. So I had a very concrete experience of that. Now, because I had it under the influence of whatever I was under the influence of, um, then you come back down and you have to make sense of that. Yeah. But what that did for me was that opened up the door to the fact that this is a rea an accessible reality. And what I learned was taking a drug is not the way to reach that accessible reality. You can reach it by going in here. And that was really the beginning of my, my spiritual life. And that have, moment. have you ever touched it again? Is it, was it a one-off thing? Yes. I, I, no, I, you know, when you talk about this, it's, it's sort of like, it, it cheapens it away because you're trying to express things that are inexpressible. You know, there's an old thing where they say, you know, Zen, Zen can never teach Zen can only point the way. But so I'm talking about things that, that are so experiential and so in here, but yes, no, I've been, I've been graced and lucky enough over my life to have a number of experiences like that. And do you yeah. think it's what people encounter when they, they pass from this realm? Then do you think you're going into like a cosmic consciousness, you know, where everything's interconnected? You know, is that what it felt like as you were? Well, uh, you know, I think it's, I don't think you need to, 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 to pass over into another realm to experience that. Uh, there, are, there are levels of it that we can experience right here and right now. Yeah. I actually, you know, I've come to the conclusion over the years, and I, and I don't mean it metaf uh, metaphorically, I mean it literally. This is all a dream. And whether you're, quote, alive or whether you're in the, quote, afterlife, it's yeah. the same dream. Sure. And the game is about connecting to that reality that's beneath the dream, that informs the dream, you know? It's the biggest cliche in the world to say, you know, we're all connected, we're all one, and it's all love. Yeah. But to experience that is yeah. a very different thing. And 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 I don't mean to say because having had that experience somehow makes me wise or anything like that. My, my wife and I talk about this like, kind of like, well, I had that experience and now I'm dumb again. 
you know, <laughs> but you have the memory of having experienced that. Yeah. And yeah. just knowing that that is real and a possibility leads you on until the next time you're graced with an experience like that. And what did it do to change you? What, what happened? Like, what was, what's... Well, it changes your entire perception of reality and who we are on this planet, what we're here for, what this means, yeah. what other people are, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, and hopefully that informs your decisions and it informs the way you live your life. And, you know, it happens. So it happens when you're young and I'm looking at myself when I'm in my teens and 20s. And so here's this like ball of wisdom and magic and spirituality surrounded by teenage and young adult dysfunction and immaturity and psychological immaturity. And there's, you know, that big fight between like this outer shell of like your 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 dysfunctional personality and the truth that you've experienced, you know, and hopefully as you get older, it expands out a bit more, you know. I can still be the biggest jerk on the face of the planet, as people know me. We'll be happily attest, you know. Mm -hmm. But but you hope that as as you grow with it, as you continue to work on yourself, yeah. that that becomes, you know, it used to be in my life, it felt more like this. Whoa, up here, and you have this experience, and you come back down. And then over the years, it feels more like a smooth rolling wave mm -hmm. where you can connect to it more. And, and maybe... Uh, a consciousness that I have just in my day to day, if I had that when I was 17, might've felt like, wow, yeah, it's yeah. just been integrated into your life in a lot more. And if I was going to boil it all down, you know, in the most cliched way, but I think it's true. It all comes down to compassion. Mm -hmm. It all comes down to the fact that we are connected. And I think compassion is, you know, we would look at the, 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 the polarity in the world and all this crap that's going on. And yet I think if you take every individual person, the only thing people want is to be treated with a little kindness because underneath that, that's what we are. I, we are compassion and we are love. And I think every time we experience that and gift that to each other, we're, that's kind of like what I was saying about watching the twilight zone. We're gifting each other with the knowledge of what we already are. Right. Right. If you, to experience God is to not experience something out there is to experience the truth of who we are beneath the layers and levels of stuff. It's almost like it's a cocoon, you know, and we the, the job is to kind of get through the cocoon and and let that inner stuff. You know, we, we think our body is the cocoon, mm -hmm. but our body is the thing inside the cocoon. Mm -hmm. You know, or there's a famous story about a spiritual master who uh, he was trying to integrate this cosmic consciousness with with the, the world. And, and his disciples found him one day and he would covered himself from head to toe in shit and it had hardened and they had to peel this stuff off. And, and sometimes I think, you know, we come into the world with the reality of who we are mm -hmm. and then um, whatever, you know, whatever struggle and dysfunction we face, this, these layers of shit get layered all over us and harden. And we think that's who we are. Mm -hmm. And the game becomes peeling that all off to discover what's underneath there. Cause I think there's a fundamental self, even not just spiritually, but just in terms of our personality, there's a fundamental self that we come into our lives with. And I think the way we grow up and the way our parents handle us and the way the world handles us can bend that or twist that or allow that to grow in a really healthy way. So yes. whether it's psychological or spiritual, for me, the whole journey is about becoming that which we already are. What did you see the purpose of the journey? Like whenever you had this revelation, like what did you see the purpose of things being? <sighs> And again, it all sounds like cliche. Sometimes cliches you know? are correct. You know? Well, like, they're cliches because they're, they're true, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, the purpose is to know that you, that God isn't out there, that God is in here, that the entire universe is inside you, that you, we are God, and God is this energy, and this energy is 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 love. And when I say love, uh, you know, it's a it's a love on a level beyond you know beyond just human love. Um, it, it's it's a search for that identity. You know, there's a great, I, actually the first Defender story I ever wrote was was trying to express this in a very clumsy way. You know, I, um, you know, I have a spiritual master named Meher Baba and, and I'm going to completely mangle the essence of what he said here. But the idea is, you know, God is love and love must love. But if you're infinite oneness, if you're infinite love, love needs a lover and a beloved. So God dreams out of his imagination, this universe with all these separate beings who think they're separate, but it's like me saying, this is Fred, this is Bill, this is Susie, this is Bob. It's just my hand and I'm pretending and making personalities, you know? Yeah. And the game is to unveil yourself, to discover that the God you've been seeking all along is your own self. Right. Some lovely you know? ideas, some nice ideas. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny, like I was saying though, it's interesting that 
probably the last 20 years, like writers from the last 20 years have been very shut off to the idea of a spiritual side. You know, that I think post Richard Dawkins, you know, the idea of anything other than the physical material is seen as something that's immature or backward or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So everything's about science, everything's about space. And it's like I say, going out there. Do you think we've lost something as a result of that? Because when everything has to be tangible. Yeah. And I don't know if that's, you know, maybe that's the reality that's being presented to us, but I think there are plenty of people in the world that are working on that other reality, you know, in, working in the West though, less so, you know, I mean, I'm just back from the Middle East and I'm always surprised whenever I'm in Asia or India, you know, or, or, or the Middle East, I'm always surprised. I don't know. There's a, I don't know. There's no cynicism, which I think is really interesting. Like, Everybody believes in something other than what they can see in front of them. Right. Which creates right. a very different culture, doesn't it? It's a different right. culture. You go to America, you go to the UK or Europe, and everybody's slightly sarcastic and everything, you know, and they've got a, 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 a pessimism that I don't think exists out in the East in, in a lot of ways. That's know? interesting. But I, I think, you know, this is this is my own personal thing about groups versus individuals. <clears throat> I've, you know, I'm, I'm That old Groucho line, I, you know, I'd never belong to uh, any group that would have me as a member. I've always been suspicious of groups. Yeah. I think I think when people are one-on-one, -on -one, like this conversation we're having here, yeah. you get to something real. The more you sort of put the group together, yeah. the more opportunity there is for everything to get fucked up. You know, so I think if you if you deal with people one on one, I think you'll find in a lot of people that spiritual core is there. They may not want to talk about it, yeah. you know, in a public setting, you know, yeah. Yeah. but it's there. And the thing I also enjoy, I've you know, read a lot of quantum physics stuff over the years, say Eastern spirituality and quantum physics. There's a place where that all meets because they're talking about the same stuff mm -hmm. with different language. Mm -hmm. It's all energy. Uh, it's the what's the word? The implicate order, they call it. You know, this whole idea that really what we're seeing is not there. It's all energy and we are projecting form. There's no there's no real table here. This is this is energy. Yeah, and we yeah. there's non-locality. We're all composed of the same energy and you're not there and I'm here. Mm -hmm. uh, Mayor Baba had a line where he said and I may mangle it again. Uh the idea of we are when we say we are one, the oneness is such that even to use the collective term we mm -hmm. in we are one is incorrect because mm -hmm. there is no we. There's only one. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very easy to say that. It's another thing to try to live it. And we are flawed humans, and I am certainly a flawed human, and I will screw up and I will screw up continually, you know? Yeah. But to have that vision, to have those experiences, and to continue to try to live that in even the smallest way is a great gift, I think. So do you, do you, feel, do you feel aligned with any spiritual movement? now you know is, is there anyone in particular because i know from your background here you know it's very eclectic and everything is there anything you subscribe to personally or do you do you sort of, to have a little cluster that you're interested in i have well since i'm 19 years old 18 19 years old i um, i have this spiritual master meher baba mm -hmm. um and uh but the thing with the with the meher baba path is just as i said about groups there are baba groups and i have attended baba meetings and all that stuff but it's not about that Mm -hmm. It's about a personal inner connection. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's been about from the first time I read one of his books and I had closed the book and had a very profound experience yeah. uh, 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 energ energetically. So what I always say to people is, you know, we can talk about this stuff that we're blue in the face, but I believe it's an experience that you can have. Yeah. You know, so for me to tell you, oh, God is real and God is love, that's, you know, it's it's bullshit until you experience it for yourself. And it's the same thing in my relationship with Mary Baba. When people ask me about Mary Baba, well, he died in 1969. He has been a very real living presence in my life mm -hmm. for my basically my entire adult life. Mm -hmm. But if someone asks me, I'm not going to convince you that Mayor Baba is is you know is an incar a divine incarnation or whatever else. Mm -hmm. um, I say you know look into it. If you have an experience that resonates with you, then it's true. And if you yeah. don't, then it's not. You know, I I think when I was younger, I was a little more evangelical about it. You know. Uh, uh, and I've learned over the years to just kind of let it be, you know, uh, I'm not in control of that one. And what about growing up, were you, were you kind of culturally Jewish or was it a religious thing for you? Were you guys? I, I kind of had it, I had an Italian Catholic father and, and a Russian Jewish mother, yeah. you know, so uh, I was technically raised Jewish in that I had a bar mitzvah, right, yeah. but I had all this Italian Catholic stuff and we celebrated Christmas and Easter. And I, you know, my father would take me to church with him sometimes. And we'd go to all the Italian relatives on Sunday and eat pasta and meatballs. And, you know, so I had everything. I plus, you know, I had, did you get presents for 
for Christmas? It was mostly after, yeah, mostly Christmas. The Hanukkah was like you know, it was a footnote, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so even though I even though I uh, you know I had that that Jewish side of things to me, it all it was all much more cultural than it was religious. Right. Yeah. So you know, being Italian Catholic meant you know eating all that great food. Yeah. And then there was all the the the, the you know the, the the Jewish side of the food, and I was I was well fed from both sides. You know? <laughs> I was a, I was a, for several years of my uh, childhood, I was quite a pudgy little thing, you know, and because uh, I was very well fed, um, you know, and 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 it's so funny now because now uh, if you think about it. If if some you know some Italian guy marries some Jewish girl, it happens all the time. But in yeah. my parents' era, yeah, it was like you know uh, in the 1940s, a Hindu marrying a Muslim or something. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It was like yeah. that big a deal. It, it sent shockwaves through the family, <laughs> you know. But for me, that what that meant growing up was I saw there's no difference to this stuff, you know. Yeah. yeah, the food's a little different, but they're both overfeeding you. There's plenty of guilt to go around on both sides, you know. <laughs> Catholic guilt <laughs> multiplied by Jewish guilt. I mean, that's yeah, it was really, rad. and I, I still live with that to this day, you know. But I think that's in some ways that's one of the reasons why, you know, when I found my own path, it yeah. it, it wasn't attached to any religion. Mayor Baba is not a religion. Mayor Baba is a path, right? And there's a difference there. It's interesting, but that's what must have given you your curiosity because you had such an eclectic mix. Of influences, then didn't you? You know, you yeah. went off in one tradition. So, so suddenly everything's interesting to you, really. Isn't yeah, it? because yeah, you were yeah. never told there's one correct way. I guess you know. Yeah, yeah, and you know, then by the time you're a teenager, you're rejecting it all anyway. Yeah, and then I have this experience when I'm 17, and I start to read these books, and I see at the heart of every tradition that I'm reading about is the same experience. Yes, yeah, and then that experience. Well. Yeah, someone tries to express that experience and somehow it gets turned into rules and regulations and then a religion. Yeah. And that's where it gets lost. You know, yeah. but it comes down to an experience that is accessible, I think, to anyone and everyone. That's amazing. How interesting is this interview? This is uh... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we really we really went uh, we really went deep there, didn't we? <laughs> yeah. I need to ask you one last thing before I go. OK, which sure. Is, which is uh, about your, your whole new imprint. You know, I'm I'm so fascinated by this because. You know, you're you're never standing still, which I think I think it's your I think it's your great gift. You know, you're always interested in the next thing, and the fact you're doing Spellbound with a a Kickstarter, I love that yeah. idea. You know that uh, you know you're not just going with some publisher doing the traditional route. How's that worked out for you? Is it, has it gone well? You know, it's it was great. It turned I had never done a Kickstarter before, yeah. and um, I'll try to I'll give you the short version of the story. I thought about it over the years because I'm always I, I'm always working on creator owned ideas. You know, things that I just want to do for myself, not through anybody else's mouth or company. Um, but it just Kickstarters just seem like so much work. I just, you know, not the creative part. The creative part is the fun part, but dealing with the Kickstarter and all the, all the bells and whistles that go with that. And I became friends with a guy named David Baldy. He took one of my uh, my Imagination 101 workshops. And David worked in TV as a producer and a writer for 20 years. We became really good friends. And we are talking to him one day, and 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 he said, I'll, I'll run a Kickstarter for you, you know? And and he said, what ideas do you have? And I started, you know, well, I got this one, I got this one. I, you, know, you know how it is, you, know, you have an idea, you work on it, you put it away. Two years later, you take it out, you put it away. So I pitched him like four ideas and... and thinking we're going to pick one and we'll do like a four or five issue miniseries and kickstart. And he was the one that said, let's do all four of them. Let's do four number ones. Yeah. And I thought, that's a great idea. Let's get all these ideas out at once. And we ended up throwing in a fifth as well by the time we were done, you know? Yeah. And I worked with, you know, five great artists and David and I worked our asses off on this Kickstarter and it was really, really fun and uh, very successful. And the books are at the printer right now. Uh, and everyone should have their books probably at the end of March, beginning of April, Fantastic. you know, you and then, you, and then the plan again? is one of the things we're going to do is that the, anyone that supported all the books or bought the collected edition gets yeah. to vote on which book they'd like to see continue. That's cool. I love this. What I love though, is that uh, we're in this really amazing period just now that I don't think we've even quite maximized yet. You know, we've, we've come out of this, of you know, this newsstand and direct market and it's unlimited now, isn't it? And a global market and everything too. Like, yes. People yes. are trying lots of new things and I love it. So I like the idea that there is with the Kickstarter, there's no wall between the creator and audience at all. Yeah. It's yeah. you and your work, and then there's them. And that's it. Yeah. So yeah, so hopefully we will then we'll continue the first one. And then I'm free with the others if I want to go to another publisher and say, hey, do you want to, you know, you want to help us finish this one series here or there? Yeah. But one way or the other, we want to get them all done and get them out there. 
amazing. I can't wait. I'm going to have to. Well, you luckily sent me the PDFs, you know, but like, yeah. I'll, I'll support these two. Are they good? Will they eventually come into bookstores or, or will it be something that'll be exclusive? Uh, maybe event right now, it's just either through the Kickstarter or people that didn't get a chance to support the Kickstarter can go to spellboundcomics.com and you can still purchase any of the books through Spellbound. Brilliant. That's great. Well, listen, so, uh, yeah. thanks again. One last thing, you know, I sure. Think you're, you're the wisest guest we've ever had. Give us one piece of advice. <laughs> one oh, dear piece of advice. God. One Please. piece of advice for I'm anyone. an idiot, just like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> You've had this amazing career. What would you say to somebody who's who's working in comics? With you? Somebody who's struggling, you know, trying to get into the business yeah. and it's not happening, you know, or their, their books are getting cancelled, whatever, you know. What have you learned from, from over 40 years of doing this? You know, we're talking about how cliches are true. Yeah. The the biggest cliche and one of the truest is is you know the follow your bliss cliche. Yeah. But you really do. You have to follow your passion. I always say to people, follow your passion. It may not lead you where you expect to go, but it'll always lead you someplace good. You know, I think my goal is over there. I'm going to go to that to that town over there and that's where my dreams are going to come true and you're walking over there and suddenly there's a wall and you can't get over it and oh there's a door over there and you walk through that door and it leads you someplace unexpected. But because you are following your passion, I really believe to my core that it will lead you someplace good. I think the mistake some people make is just don't that they, they give up. You know, and like I said, God didn't make me very good at other things. So I had no <laughs> giving up was never an option, you know. I had to keep going and and be open to the surprises that the universe throws you away. Just like I was talking about the animation thing. Yeah. Not on not on my list, you know. Yeah. And that's great thing about comics it's opened so much as you've seen in your own life amazingly yeah. opened so many doors that i never expected would ever open i, you know? I was just happy to eat i thought if i can right. eat exactly. do well, like, you know, it's okay. like i said those first stories they didn't even have to pay me i didn't care <laughs> i'm writing a comic book this is the coolest thing in the world you know <laughs> Listen, brilliant having you on. I better get the kids to bed now. You know, they've been hovering about. I hope this isn't going to be too noisy when it's all uh, all played yeah. back. But you know, I don't really fantastic. hear much of anything other than you on my end, so don't worry about that. Fantastic. But this what a great guest. Conversation. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. And it's great to finally meet you face-to-face -face through too. a computer. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, take good care. Bye. Hey, folks. Hope you enjoyed the interview. Just to remind you, that's Nightclub Issue 3, Magic Order Issue 2, and Nemesis Reloaded Issue 2, all on sale in February. Uh, look forward to catching you next week. All the best then.